apologize for being late. We went a little long on our radio show this morning, so um, we get to do that once a month with WLKF. And so I'm ex so excited about us being able to kick off this budget workshop. And this for us becomes the defining time for looking forward to what we're going to do with next year and the constraints that we have in place. And so uh, this is your show, uh, as city manager. And so we thank you very much for all the preparation and in advance, Mike Rosart, as our finance director, of the work been done for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and um, welcome <coughs> to our City of Lakeland Fiscal Year 2023 Budget Workshop. This workshop is the continuation of our budgetary process that began with our strategic planning retreat last February. Since that time, staff has continued to develop a proposed budget and has been updating the city commissioners individually during one-on-one -on -one meetings and at other related city commission workshop sessions. Today, the city commission will receive an overview of the proposed fiscal year 23 budget that in its present form has been composed using certain estimates and assumptions. The purpose of today's workshop is to prepare the city commission to make decisions and give direction that is needed to finalize our budgetary process by our public adoption hearing scheduled for Thursday, September 22nd. Following staff presentations today and city commission discussions and input, the city commission may be ready to make decisions and give needed direction. However, most of the remaining budgetary development process will be determined by the City Commission. If the City Commission is prepared to make decisions by the end of our workshop today, we can advance the process. If not, we can schedule additional workshops throughout the months of August and September, in addition to the two required public hearings tentatively scheduled for September 8th and September 22nd. So most of today will really be at the will of the commission. We're gonna have uh, department um, updates and discussions uh, specifically from our, our finance director. But once we've provided that information, which I'll just tell you in advance, I don't think we'll take the full morning. It will be up to the commission as to how long you would like uh, to discuss the matters throughout the day. And it can be a full day. As you know, we held the time on the calendar uh, in, in, um, in expectation that there would be full discussions. And then as I stated a moment ago, depending on how far those discussions go today, um, if we're able to make decisions by the end, then uh, we can advance the budget process. If not, there's plenty of time to schedule other workshops uh, in the month of, of August. And so that's kind of the plan for today. We've got several presentations uh, prepared to uh, guide at least the beginning of the discussions. The first one is one that you see each year when we're at this budget workshop. I'm gonna call on our Water Utility Director, Bill Anderson, to discuss staff's recommendation regarding year one of our three-year adopted rate plan that was previously adopted by this commission. As you're aware, even though it's previously adopted each year, we do a review to ensure that the commission wants to stay the course with that three-year rate plan. So with that, I will turn it over for our opening presentation to our utility director, Water Utility Director, Bill Anderson. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, if you need it, Bill Anderson, Director of Water Utilities. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, provide a real brief update uh, on the status of the water utility budget. Um, if you recall, last year, uh, the City Commission approved a three-year rate plan. Those resolutions were passed unanimously in uh, September. And so we're just uh, wrapping up year one of that three-year rate plan. As you can see on the screen, that was a 2% water and wastewater rate adjustments for each of the three fiscal years. Um, we are currently on plan and uh, moving forward. As you know, uh, in years past, our rate consultant has come and spoken with you, presented to you. Since we're on this three-year rate plan, this is just a, just a brief update. However, we continue to work with the uh, uh, consultant on the revenue sufficiency. Just because they're not here today, we have met with them and we continue to do that on an annual basis and review where we are uh, in regard to our budget. So um, again, we are currently on plan. If you recall, those 2% uh, rate adjustments for the water and wastewater system were basically for the uh, 
uh, base charges and some of the other fees that we charge, what we did do, if you recall, was, uh, I'll use the word tweak, basically the volume charges for residential is what we kind of adjusted a little bit. We kept that first tier the same, no change to that rate for all three years. And that, I think it's very important to realize that impacts every residential user, not just the low user, even somebody using 20,000 gallons a month, they still pay that same uh, initial rate for the 7,000. So that impacts everybody, there is no change to that. What we did though was the upper tiers, we adjusted those a little bit to encourage the pricing pressure on water conservation. So um, that is going to continue this year and on into the next two years as well. Um, if you recall too, uh, per the commission's uh, request, we also took a look at the commercial rates and over those three year periods, we're also adjusting those a little bit to bring them in line more with the system average as well. Um, this graph, you saw it last year, this has been updated. This shows our current rate in comparison to, I think it's 19 or 20 other municipalities and counties across the state. It shows our uh, current rate, which is that first uh, brownish, and then the next two years, those rate adjustments in comparison to everybody else. You'll note too that while our rates for each of the fiscal are, it's showing those, we don't know what the other municipalities, so that those other, everything in green and blue, that's all current rates. We fully expect that entire uh, graph to shift to the right. So even if it doesn't, even if everybody stayed the same, we're still below the median on our water and wastewater rate. And so looking forward, um, again, the, the water uh, and wastewater rates, um, they were adopted for the three years, and really the message is we're on plan. Going through the rate sufficiency analysis that our consultant did working with staff, we're, we're on the plan that we set forth, and that's the recommendation is to maintain that. Quick and easy. That will, <laughs> will, will stand for any questions or, or any discussion from the city commission, as Bill alluded to, and you'll remember last year we had the consultant here uh, to present, and, and that was how we, you know, um, uh, ended up with the with the three year rate plan again. This is year one of that of that rate plan. Um, staff recommends that we stay the course because we are on target with that. But if there's any questions or comments from the commission, uh, we'll we'll take that now. What's our rate for seven thousand gallons? Don't, I I don't recall exactly what it was, and I don't think it's on this graph. I know we have that information, I can get it to you, I just don't know what it is, per thousand gallons for that uh, first 7,000. David, I'm looking back at staff. It's about 279. Per thousand gallons for that first 7,000. And then once you reach, go up to 8,000, mm -hmm. that does increase slightly. Right. That's the $85. Right. And Commissioner, I, can, uh, I know that information is on a website, and I can certainly email you that link. That's about all right. Don't, okay. worry, don't worry about that. Close enough. Yes, sir. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, sir. Uh, and good morning. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do you believe because of what we did, I'm going back now several years back, because, you know, our, the rates uh, we're, we're looking at now, the adjustments for the next three years, is much smaller than what we did back some years ago. Do you believe what we did then helped support where we are today? I think so, yes, and, and this predates me, but from what I do recall of that history, yes. there were years where there weren't any increases. Exactly. And then all of a sudden you have a larger increase yes. to make up for that. And, and that is, you know, yes, short answer is yes. And that's led us to where we are today with these very small incremental increases. And I really believe that's a very fiscally and operationally prudent way to proceed, yes. that provides us surety, it, it provides our bond rating agency surety, and, and it's just overall a very good good way to operate, I believe. Thank you. Yep, instead of reacting, yes. if you will. Well, most, most residents would be in the 7,000 gallon range, and so what you, um, and most of us in this room would be, so what you really have done is preserved costs for those people while 
really raising the penalties for less potentially less responsible use and that's what we're goal that's the goal Yes, thank you. Coming from the cloud. Morning, Bill. Thank you for the update. It's always good to hear that we're on plan. So what kind of scenarios would cause us to be off plan you know, from now or going in, into the future? I, I hate to be predictive, but any kind of, let's say, catastrophic failure in our water or wastewater system that, that would entail a huge capital investment that, that we're not that is not foreseen. Um, anything like that, you know, obviously we work very hard to prevent that. Um, but, uh, you know, if we, if we have some, you know, a, a brand new wastewater plant, let's say, that all of a sudden we have a, a, an immediate need for, if you will, that could cause uh, those rates to go, you know, up because we'd have to pay for that, of course. But again, we try to predict those things and plan for those things uh, long term. Thank you. And, and certainly, Commissioner McLeod, on that too, on the Polk Regional Water Cooperative basis, you know, as you know, that's an eight-year out kind of thing, but there will be a large adjustment for all members uh, in water to absorb that as we go forward. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Madden. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Chair, you just, when uh, Commissioner McLeod asked the question about sort of just potential opportunities for an increase, you know, due to some unforeseen catastrophes, um, recently we've been hearing about of folks doing that and have had some incidences where the laser hits the um, water infrastructure and it's not just even the initial cost of repairing the water infrastructure but it's those future EPA regulations if it hits the um, sewer main and then how that affects the soil around it that we could be charged penalties into the future and not really even know you know what those could potentially be so how many of those incidences would it take to qualify something like you said, some kind of a catastrophe to be able to have that affect our rate payers? In my experience with the regulatory agencies with those types of events, if you will, um, I wouldn't foresee that causing an unusual, uh, a catastrophic, while any spill obviously is, in my opinion, catastrophic. Not to the point like a, a new wastewater plant. Um, in my experience dealing with the regulatory agencies, while we are, as the service provider, responsible and subject to penalties, I've never seen those penalties rise to the level of, you know, impacting rates such as that. You know, th those spills that we do have are usually cumulative over the course of a year. Um, we certainly report those, whether it doesn't matter whose fault it is, um, we're responsible for that. So we do report those as we're required to, um, and the regulatory agency responds with communication or, or uh, some form, you know, possibly a consent order or anything like that. But I've never seen it rise to the level of impacting rates. My pleasure. Any other questions? Um, can you, would this be the right spot to ask for a little update on the a sewer uh, proposal that ARPA funds are using? Absolutely. Okay. So as if you recall, I know Sean sent out an uh, update a couple weeks ago. Um, as we're, we've been working through the process that we need to follow to ensure we're eligible and remain eligible for those funds, we had to come back and put uh, uh, generate an RFP, which included the price component for that work. That was not done with the original RFQ. It, not, it normally isn't, but since then we found out that is required. We've uh, 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 developed that R RFP. We're hoping that goes out uh, public advertisement this week. Great. Yep. Perfect. Other comments or questions? All right. Next, sir. Okay, thank you, thank Mr. You. Anderson. Appreciate you. the uh, update on that. Stay I failed course. to mention a moment ago, but just to, again, guide the discussions throughout the rest of the day, although um, we won't be receiving many presentations from our senior management team, we do have all of our senior management team uh, with us and will be with us throughout the day. So as we get into areas of discussions, um, we have them available to add context to the conversation. So we're going to now move into... Um, our uh, budget discussion um, that will be led by our finance director, Mr. Brosart. Um, and this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> will involve various budget assumptions. There uh, are also at least four operational recommendations that will be addressed 
following uh, the initial conversations and, and presentation from Mr. Brosart, um, and most of this is coming out of, and you will recall these from our strategic planning workshop. So we're going to be pausing throughout the uh, presentation from Mike to talk about, in particular, four different operational needs. And so I kind of want to point those out to you so that you can be thinking about those and tracking along. And, and again, you'll relate them back to our strategic planning discussion. And those items are um, the conversation that we started at strategic planning uh, revo uh, regarding the um, retention and recruitment of employees and the job market that we're currently in and experiencing. Uh, we also are going to talk about the um, Lakeland Fire Department and the level of service uh, needs that uh, are provided for in the proposed budget. Uh, additionally, we're going to talk about the Lakeland Police Department and their level of service and uh, the funding that's uh, programmed into the proposed budget and certainly dependent upon the discussions that we have with the commission today. And then finally, um, also the operations and the future operations of the RP Funding Center. Uh, we'll talk about that throughout the presentation as well. So those are four of the items from strategic planning that are specifically related to operations that we're going to address throughout the presentation. But to get things started, I'm going to yield then to uh, our finance director, Mike Brosart, to lead our budget presentation, starting with budget assumptions in the FY23 budget. Mike. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> You've seen this slide each year. For me, it's a starting point as to how we are, are entering into the budget process, uh, the assumptions first in the general fund uh, being property value growth coming from uh, Marsha Fox's office. Uh, you can see that that number is, is very positive, 1466. Uh, for 22, that's 11.29%. Uh, what we don't know is what to project for 24 and 25. Uh, I rely heavily on the experts in community development for those items that we know are coming down the road, 24 and 25, two and three years that are out, uh, and they can use just what they know of uh, without any speculation. What we don't know is property value growth. That's the unknown that nobody can predict, that a lot of times is driven by the economy. Florida is a little bit different than many of the other states. People still choose to move here. Uh, when, when they are slowing down in other states, so that is likely to continue to drive property values, but right now we just don't know. City manager authorized 2.5% operating expense growth and controllable costs for the departments. I will tell you just as an example, in a general fund, there's 14 departments that, uh, that are, have budgets, uh, parks, recreation, uh, fire, police, some of the larger ones and smaller ones as, as, as well. And of those 14, nine came in at or below their, their target for controllable costs. Those that went above, uh, there were just two major costs associated with that, totaling around $300,000 for all of those controllable costs. One is uh, a proposal by the city manager to increase tuition reimbursement for employees from 2000 to 2500 a year. And the other is uh, in, in our uh, legal department, we're recognizing an increase in, in legal fees throughout the city. And so we've increased that uh, by $188,000. Now that does get billed out amongst all the departments that need it, which is we budget that in the general fund. So, so I, I think that's, you know, that's a strong message that uh, the city manager provided to all the departments hold the line absorb all that you can uh, with the increased costs. Many noted 25 to 50% cost increases minimum for chemicals and those types of items that they, that they were incurring, um, but that folks took it seriously. Uh, we, we are anticipating a 5% increase. Mike, if I can, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let, me, let me just interrupt real quick just to make a couple of comments on what was just presented. Um, just, just two things. Mike already touched on one. Um, you know, in past years, we have uh, kept controllable uh, cost at times at a 1.5% increase, um, but we've increased that this year to a 2.5% a <coughs> allowance. And obviously, you know, with inflation and the cost of fuel and everything that everyone is experiencing, you know, out there outside of local government, we're impacted by those increased costs as well. And so um, allowing to the 2.5%. Um, has helped us prepare a budget where we won't hopefully end up 
with many shortfalls if we were too conservative on that um, moving into the budget. And the other thing I wanted to comment on is related to the tuition reimbursement. You know, obviously that is um, reimbursed to employees who utilize that after they have uh, completed their coursework, and it's just an estimate. It, it's a projection. So the number that we have been projected, if it's not utilized, if we don't have as many employees throughout the year who utilize that, well, then that would just result in a in a surplus that would remain, um, you know, in 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 the budget. So um, it is just a projection. But you know, we've been having a lot of conversations about trying to become that best place to work in the Central Florida region. Um, some of the retention and recruitment um, concerns that we have um, that we've talked about and we'll talk about more this morning, but investing in our employees and, and giving them the ability to advance their professional careers uh, through obtaining uh, college you know, coursework and the like um, goes a long way in a, in a tough job market and should help us in those uh, retention and, and recruitment efforts. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> As mentioned, uh, we anticipate about a 5% increase in health insurance costs. We'll know better in the next couple of months when we see June and July's actuals come through. Uh, but for right now, we're anticipating a 5% increase. Across the boards, I know the city manager had discussed it during the retreat, and and I think uh, even, even most recently is a commission meeting uh, where uh, HR Director Farrington discussed the need for across the boards of 5% uh, across across the city uh, for those that are eligible, as well as a 2.5% merit. So with with that, we're going to let Sean take back over and, and talk a little bit about that very topic. Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, sorry. Yes, Commissioner Walker and then Commissioner McCarley. Were you first? Go ahead, Commissioner Walker. Okay. Go. Um, looking at the 5% uh, uh, ATB across the board uh, situation and 2.5% and for merit, how does that compare? Because if I'm hearing what I'm hearing, or what we did here from Mr. Farrington about, you know, uh, retention and trying to make sure we keep the best of best with us in, instead of having them go elsewhere, how is that compared compared to other municipalities? How do we? How would that? Com how would that? I guess be at this point when we compare it to what other municipalities may be doing. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I'm going to cover that in, in the next two slides. Okay, so um, I jumped and, the gun. And so Thank you. I know Commissioner McCarley had a question. If it's similar, I'm about to cover that, but if it's now a different... I have a specific to Mr. Brosart. You said the 5% increase in health insurance we would know in June or July. Do you mean next year, June or July? No, we, once we get June and July's actuals, all we Thank had was you. projections through yeah, May. Yeah, I just wanted a clarification. And so Thank we're, you. we're keeping an eye on that. And it's all related to what we've seen with COVID uh, increases. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't explain that better. June and July are pending. Thanks. Yes. And Commissioner Madden. Andrew. <laughs> so thank you. And tell me, uh, covering that as well, I just didn't want to gloss over the cost increases too much because I know that with supply chain and you know the private sector as well, everyone is when you say twenty five to fifty percent cost increases, that's pretty big when you consider that we're having a one point five increase to two point five on our you know, keeping those costs. So certainly appreciate, you know, the efficiencies, certainly appreciate us holding the line. Um, but how do you prioritize then within departments emergency preparedness? So certainly those things that in case we have a hurricane or in case, you know, how are those prioritized differently? Because I know in your, in your family budget or in your business that you think I'm going to be buying less because everything's 50% more. But we would not want to buy less of things that are pertaining to our critical infrastructure, providing critical services to our citizens. Well, I'm, the, the departments um, through our process, you know, come in with um, their request, and as Mike talked about, you know, they have a, a target that they're expected to uh, remain under, you know, unless there's a justification for that. And so the departments themselves also, you know, calculate into that some of the risk involved with, you know, should we have a uh, an emergency type situation, and then, um, you know, in addition to that, and, and really our, our biggest area um, where we would we would would cover emergency type events would be you know in the in the day days cash and in the in the surplus mm -hmm. that's projected into the budget of which we're going to cover Mike certainly as we always do you know toward the end of this presentation but um, it is because of the requirements of the um, city 
that we remain you know above a minimum of 45 to 60 days cash and we've been conservative in that and, and in the past and in, in emergency events like hurricanes you know the city of lakeland has fared very well because we had a, a healthy um, days cash and and surplus and i would absolutely you know agree that that's why we were so much better off after irma than so many of our um, fellow cities and counties, uh, but with the supply chain constraints globally, it's just that's kind of what happened through the pandemic as people noticed, oh, if I've got cash, I can go buy that. But if there's no transformers, you know, when I need them after the storm or if there's no whatever else it is that each department would know that they have to have, I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm sure that they are watching uh, webinars and listening to the experts to mitigate some of these supply chain constraints as well, but it's a little different um, climate in 2022 with regard to supply chain, what we've experienced through uh, the pandemic. And so I would just, you know, I know the tendency is, you know, when you're in charge to say, we cannot spend, we cannot spend, and I appreciate that. I, I love the fact that y'all are um, such great fiscal stewards of our uh, taxpayer money. But just being in this unique time and knowing we don't know if we'll have a hurricane or not this season, if in fact it pertains to us recovering or to critical infrastructure or critical services that we provide our citizens, I would hate for us to not buy it thinking we have cash and then it's not available when we need it. So that's just kind of the point I'm wanting to make and I'm hopeful that each department is you know, doing a lot of that assessment um, after the last two years of pandemic supply chain. It, you know, it's everywhere, so I'm sure that they are doing those things, but I did just want to bring that up. That's, that's a great point. We, Commissioner, we, very much encourage departments to stay ahead of the curve on that. And really, it doesn't take any encouragement. Folks are on top of it. Um, I know uh, Mike Beckham, uh, Gina, before that, even Joel, they, they were working towards, you know, how many transformers can we get, keep on site, those types of items. Uh, we, we do anticipate that bear behind the tree. A great example is in fleet. Uh, we we were able to negotiate where we've got the, the, the pay cards where people can go to any gas station in the city and use a card. That wasn't good enough for us. We are now spending the money or finalizing that to have the station back up and operating again so that we do have the fuel just in case. And so to your point, we, departments are taking that upon themselves. I know, you know, uh, Bob Donahue will talk about you know, what does it take when they have a problem and we have an emergency pop up? Well, they know they've got to get out there with police, fire, uh, solid waste, electric to clear trees for lines, those types of things. Do they have the chainsaws? Do we have those types of things well ahead of time? And so they are doing that. So good question. Glad you asked. But know that we are asking those same questions as well. And those, those are things that we will not ever skimp on. Yes, and and where, Commissioner, we have the ability to kind of stockpile some of those supplies that we know we would eventually use anyway, um, we've, we've tried to do that in some areas. Mike mentioned, um, you know, even out at Fleet, I was there last Wednesday, and I know the, the fuel island and tank is, is getting close to completion. We still have our um, uh, the 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 um, fuel uh, trucks that can store uh, fuel as well so where where it's available we can um, stockpile some supplies but again obviously just it's it, it's it's reasonable to only do that in areas where like fuel we will eventually use it whether we have an emergency or not All right, thank you I appreciate Commissioner Madden's question because the question is how much is hardening for the future infrastructure built into each of the department's budgets across the board. And we want, and the desire is to have a mindset to make sure that's in place. That's great. Uh, yes, Commissioner Music. Thank you. Good to see you this morning. Great to see you, sir. Um, question. So can you tell me about like the kind of the hell of the policy of the, the city um, and their finance works? And, and let's, let's, let's pick on fleet because we know that, that we have one of the best fleets in the country. When all of the department heads are creating their, their budget to get down to you, you and your department isn't experts in, say, fleet specifically, so how are you double-checking or verifying that when we're asking them to do something that that's really what's happening and that they are having enough contingency, that they are doing the best they can for, you know, uh, preparing for the future? Well, I can tell you that, that we do have accountants, chief accountants, uh, Deidre and myself, we 
on the financial side, I would say that we have identified experts okay. that can, things don't change much over the years, so uh, we have a very good idea what we should have as a contingency and what we should have in day's cash for whatever it is, day's cash in the fleet fund, uh, in, in contingency for buying vehicles throughout the year, those types of things. Um, I know that we'll have meetings, our, our experts that are assigned to the different groups will have meetings with Heath, Greg James, and each one of their division heads, whether it's Richard Baker in facilities or, in, uh, in this case, Gary McLean in, in fleet to ask those very detailed questions so that we feel like we're asking the same things that you might ask or that Great answer. citizen That's good. might Thank ask. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Yes. Any other comments by commissioners? Okay, thank you. So back to Commissioner Walker's uh, question then regarding the 5% uh, proposed across the board. And, um, you know, commissioners, we've had some of that discussion in, in some of our one-on-one -on -one individual meetings. But going back to strategic planning where we talked about some of those retention and recruitment, you know, concerns and this tough job market that we're in, uh, at that time I had not proposed what you see now, which is the 5% um, across the board adjustment. Uh, for the employees, um, in addition to the uh, the typical you know merit increase that that we have programmed in um, each year, you know certainly uh, the issues that we're experiencing are everywhere across the country. They're not specific just to the city of Lakeland, and they cross over from the public sector to the private sector as well. Uh, the mayor and I have been for several months now going with uh, the, the executive director of the LEDC and, and also Katie Worthington, and we've been going around and meeting with some of the largest employers uh, in the city of Lakeland. And we have not gone to, I think we've maybe had nine or 10 visits at this point and we've yet to go to one of those meetings where, where these private uh, agencies and companies haven't discussed the same issues that we're, we're facing at the city of Lakeland. It's a, it's a very um, tough job market, and um, I know that as of May, at the end of May across the country, for every one person seeking a job, there were two jobs available. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. You've all, you know, heard about um, the comments and the and the little monikers that are, you know, going along with this issue, um, the silver tsunami, you know, the graying of the profession and, and people who are retiring. Um, you know, you also hear about the great uh, resignation, um, which is now being referred to as the great reshuffle because they're they're finding that. It's not that people are resigning and just not going to work and, and nobody knows where they're at. They're just reshuffling their careers and moving on to other to try other um, opportunities. At our strategic planning retreat, you know, I, I had mentioned uh, the city's experience in 2021 of losing 308 employees to both resignations and retirements. Now, that was a major increase to the previous three-year average of only 187. So for the three years prior to 20, 2021, the average was 187 employees that left the city of Lakeland related to resignations and retirements. But again, that was up in 2021 to 308. So it's a concern. It's the same concern uh, that we're hearing from other employers um, here in Lakeland, inclu including the private um, sector. Uh, just to give you some other related information, um, according to uh, governmentjobs.com and um, the public sector consultant NeoGov, NeoGov is a consultant used by over 6,000 public agencies. Since 2021, public sector job openings have increased by 45%, yet applicants for those jobs have decreased by 56%. So again, those statistics just highlight this tough job market that we're experiencing across the country. The biggest drivers based on a survey of 300 public employers is that 60% is related to retirement, but a, but a resounding 83% is based on voluntary turnover. Again, just tied back to all of the opportunities uh, for people to move around in this job market and, and try other um, things. Uh, the same survey indicates that these challenges have resulted in reducing services by the public sector of up to 20% of a reduction in services. 
and it's also had an increase in overtime expense by 64%. Now that's concerning. If we don't have enough staff, if there's not enough employees to handle the level of services that we presently pr um, provide, then we're looking at overtime expenses for the employees that we do have. What and was that percent? 64% um, is, is the result in, in increased overtime expenses. And, and so that's significant. So when we talk about, you know, the 5% across the board, you know, keep in mind that is also intended to offset some of what we would experience based on that information I just provided in the overtime expenses because we don't have the staffing levels that we need. One of the things that we talked about uh, at strategic planning was, was that based on kind of the timing of events for the city of Lakeland, we, we were not at a point where we could commission a consultant to do a pay study specific to the city of Lakeland. So we, we, we plan to do that, and that's budgeted for in this FY23 budget, and, and that will bring in a consultant like we experienced back in 2016 to, through 2018 that will study our specific uh, job uh, classifications within the organization and will also utilize very specific comparable agencies to compare to. So we cannot get that done until this coming year. So in advance of that, we do need a, a stopgap measure, and, and that's where I'm proposing the 5%. Um, what we are using uh, is a couple of things to, to base that on. One is called the, the PEPI. It's the Public Employers Personnel Information Exchange. That particular uh, study and exchange um, includes over 90 different public agency employers in the state of Florida. Now, the job classifications, it's more of a generalized type of compensation analysis. Um, it does not pare down to specific comparables. So, you know, in, in the over 90 that are utilized, many are comparable to Lakeland, but there's also many that are. In terms of job classifications, instead of getting into specific job classifications, it, it, it kind of categorizes job classifications for the purposes of a, a more general type of a study. So we now have the results um, of that and you can see that on the overhead. When we talk about our pay ranges, our pay ranges for every one of our job classifications based on our step plan, the pay ranges all have a, a minimum and, and a maximum. Mm -hmm. And so when we take a look at what the PEPI uh, uh, tells us in, in comparison to our pay scale, when you look at the minimum of the pay ranges, we are an average of, of almost 6%, 5.69% below the minimum. And then when you look at the maximum of the range, we are under by 6.93, almost 7%. So the 5% that I am proposing certainly is, you know, we can see an indication from the PEPI mm -hmm. that we, we, sh we will not be overshooting by, by you, you know, implementing a 5% because it, it looks from the generalized study that um, we, can, we can support that request. The other thing I wanted to do is um, I wanted to show you just a comparison of um, some of the other, you know, public agencies that we look to on occasion uh, to compare with, and, and it includes the state, and it also includes uh, Polk County and, and the city of Winter Haven. I wanted to take a look at some of the larger um, cities in Polk County, and that's why we utilized Winter Haven. I uh, will tell you we also, you know, reached out to Haines City. But Payne City, as you're aware of, is going through a transition right now, and they're unsure yet as to what they're looking to do in terms of compensation adjustments for their employees. But what you see is um, the city of Lakeland, as I mentioned, I'm proposing a, a 5% in the budget or requesting that. Um, the state of Florida, uh, the budget has been adopted, and, and it's a 5.38% increase for all state employees. Uh, the county... Polk County, you can see that they're, um, they're proposing a 5% uh, for all of their employees that have more than one year of service, but for the employees that are, have less than one year of service, they're proposing a 3.5%. Uh, and then the city of Winter Haven is also uh, proposing a, a 5% um, increase in their across-the-board adjustment for their employees. So that's the basis for the 5%. Uh, again, I think that's a good stopgap 
uh, measure that, that should help us in our retention of employees and also with the employees knowing and understanding that we would then move into next year and commission the compensation study and there would be further adjustments that will likely be needed but we'll be able to be more targeted based on those individual job classifications and making sure that we're using the truly comparable uh, public agencies that that we can compare to so with that um, I will I will stand for any questions or or can provide additional information our HR director uh, Mark Farrington is with us as well and Mark can certainly come forward to provide any any information uh, for the Commission Commissioner Madden and then Commissioner Reed thank you mayor thank you so much Sean um, so I am you know certainly there's always kind of a difference coming from the private sector and, and, and dealing with some of the restraints you know as a public entity so I, I don't always know those nuances so I want to kind of have some clarification points even for the public who you know is in the private sector versus the public so typically when we are here at the budget sessions we're we're thinking in terms of across the boards and in the private sector, it's not always across the board. You know, you, it, it is much more targeted, like you mentioned. You know, if you know that you're, you know, falling short recruiting a certain, you know, category, your sales reps, or maybe it's your customer service, you know, we have the flexibility in the private sector to make those targeted salary increases to attract the talent that we need to get, right? And then maybe other folks, you know, don't get the same, you know, bump because they're already high or they have commission or bonuses that give them a little opportunity to make more money. So um, with that, it sounded like, you know, we're going to do this 5% across the board. I'm always worried about across the board because sometimes, you know, maybe certain ranges are, are really great, you know, compared to others. So when you say that after we have the survey that we'll take specific positions and classifications into consideration, you know, certainly I see that we're doing the best we can, you know, to make the stopgap. Totally appreciate that effort. But I'm hopeful and I just want to clarify that when we get the information back from the survey, that do we have that flexibility to really target, say, because we've lost <coughs> several engineers from like electric and that is a special STEM related focus that's difficult because there are a lot of you know people in the private sector are really targeting that particular categorization classification do we have do you as city manager have that flexibility to really target those things that we seem to be losing more of without raising an across the board across the board Yes, Commissioner, we, okay. we will, and, and to the extent, of course, that there are always budgetary constraints, and so, you know, that, that will certainly play into it, but, but again, with a, with a full class and compensation study, you know, if we see that specific areas are, are you know, uh, our, our comparison is much lower than in other areas, then we could make specific targeted um, adjustments there. I think another thing that we're going to have to probably consider moving forward, and, and we'll see where things go, but, you know, we're, we're getting to a, a place in time where we, we typically, traditionally, always compare to the public sector. But to your point, there are certain job classifications that I think we're going to have to start comparing to the private sector and the public sector both. So, for instance, we know that, you know, in a, a lot of our linemen um, from Lakeland Electric are, are leaving to go to, to jobs that are in the private sector. And so we've got to be able to compete. Now, obviously, there's always a balance there, and we do the best we can, you know, to tell our story and talk about the differences in a pension system, you know, versus what might be out there in the private sector and job security and the other things that make, you know, public sector employment um, attractive. But at the same time, our, our, our history is showing us that in some areas we're, we're losing people to the private sector. And so I think in the next compensation study, you may see a blend of that for certain positions. But, but because of that, and that's just another example of where I think, yes, it, it can be more, more targeted. There will be some jobs where, for instance, it makes no sense to compare to the private sector. Other jobs, like maybe the one I suggested with the linemen, I think we're going to have to have a blend that includes uh, private sector as well. Great. So thank you so much, because those are pretty dramatic numbers, you know, to find out that, you know, 64 percent um, of overtime expenses, and you think about when you're, you're if I give everyone a 2 percent across the board, and that's fair, and it's adequate, you know, and then am able to have more money to bump up those who are on our critical infrastructure, you know, like our linemen or the engineers over in LE that 
we will not get, you know, and you know, just to stop the leaking, so to speak, I'm glad that you have the flexibility as the city manager to make those, especially after we get these surveys and look at the specific targeted classification. So thank you for that. Thank you. Commissioner Reed. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. <coughs> of course, in, in speaking with uh, Sean and, and Mike and, 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 and being in the general public myself, uh, there again, I totally uh, endorse a plan that we're going to have across the board. I think it's imperative that we do this to keep our employees' uh, retention as well as uh, keep them in line and so they'll be happy. But I, th I think we've made a, uh, I think you've made an excellent suggestion and I'm 100% behind you. Thank you, Commissioner. And then Commissioner Walker, uh, McCarley was next and then Walker. I just have a question with regard to drops. So when we're talking about all of these positions in our general fund and our across the boards and the 5% and 2.5% merit, what does our budget reflect when we have X number of positions in drop? How is that affected by across the boards? How is it affected by merit increases? And is there, um, is, is that arena of our team costing more than, say, the other you know, people who are not in drop yet, and how does that work just from a, from a budgetary standpoint? Uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> when, when someone goes into drop, they're usually towards the latter part of their career, so they tend to be higher in their pay grade, okay? When they go into drop, they, have, they can be in drop for up to five years. What happens is, I went into drop in December. Great example, okay? I was contributing. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I was contributing ten and a half percent. Okay, the city was contributing sixteen percent towards me. Immediately, that stops. So the city, for the next five years, is going to save money, sixteen percent of my pay every pay period for those five years. So it is a direct benefit, financial benefit to the citizens, to the city, to have people go into drop because we don't contribute anymore, the city or the, or the employee. So now, they are still treated as an employee, so for that reason, they'll still get, you know, if they're eligible for uh, an across the board, they would get the across the board. They're still treated just like an employee through that five-year period, but it is a savings to, to everyone by, by people going into drop. And that depends, too, on where you are and what Sherry presented on Monday if you're in plan A, plan B, plan C, does that fluctuate those percentages? So if you're in plan A, yours is 16%, but if I'm in B as a newer person, it's all 16% across the board? We contribute the same amount, the city contributes the same amount of money Everybody. whether somebody's in A, B, or C. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The employee contributes less in C. I didn't know that. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Going back to, I guess, uh, the comment that was made by Commissioner Madden was is in line with what my question is. Once the, uh, the study is done, Mr. City Manager, and in hopes of having in this study results that will bring us to make sure that we have our compression issues resolved, will that be a uh, part of the study as well? Um, and then, of course, if, if and when, and believe it's sooner than later, uh, we could bring ourselves in alignment with you know, being more comparable uh, when it comes to certain job classifications? Um, thank you for that question, Commissioner. That is a tough one and, and certainly makes me squirm in my chair a little. And I'm not sure if the, um, well, I've, I've, I've gone around and, and, and here soon I'm going to do a report out to the Commission, but <laughs> I've been meeting with different work groups throughout uh, the City of Lakeland organization. I've met with about 10 of them over the last few months, and I've got more to go throughout the rest of the year. And that compression question comes up pretty frequently. And we did touch on it a little bit in strategic planning. Um, and, and the reason it makes me squirm is because what I've been telling I, the employees is, is just the honest, straightforward answer, though it's difficult for some to accept, which is the cost of curing or resolving the compression issues that have been created over time is I have a hard time believing that we're probably ever going to be able to afford that ticket. I, I don't ever want to, I never want to say never, 
but it is an astronomical expense. Um, you know, in the last PACE study that I've mentioned back in, it started around 2016, I believe yes. we implemented in 2018, yes. there, there was in fact an algorithm that the consultant provided that had we applied that algorithm throughout the pay scales, we would not have compressed. But the expense of that was m much more than, than could be afforded. And so we had to accept the fact that those decisions would create some compression. You know, there are other things that are happening that we mentioned at strategic planning where even, you know, the increase to the minimum wage. You know, obviously if the, if the people at the bottom are moving up, but but the but the people above them aren't well then then that again is is another um, you know issue for compression and so I it's 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 hard for me to think that we're going to be able to resolve that one fully I think we can maybe you know uh, improve on that but it, it it's incredibly expensive I, I'm sure that uh, the consultant uh, moving forward will will probably also recommend some form of algorithm to adjust for that but uh, you know we'll have to um, evaluate that when the time comes. Now, what I've been trying to, to, to convey to the employees is, you know, one of the things about the public sector is that, um, you know, tenure has historically, you know, been a, something that everybody, you know, appreciates and wants to be recognized for. And so, as you know, you know, we have a, a step system and, and for the general employees, I think it's 19 steps that we, that we utilize. Um, and, 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 you know, everybody kind of wants to know that, well, if I've been here for a year longer than my peer, you know, I should be making more than my peer because I've been here that year longer. And what I've been trying to discuss with the employees is, you know, maybe that doesn't have to be the case. I mean, for instance, in a lot of our jobs, if you have an employee who's been here for four years and you're comparing that employee to another one doing the same job that's been there here seven years, there's a chance that those employees are probably doing the exact same work. I mean, after four years of, of experience compared to seven, you, you're probably pretty comparable in what you're able uh, to do in, in your job classification. And so, you know, there, there's going to be employees like that who tenure's not going to really separate them as much because of the compression um, issues. And, and I think it, it may just be something that, again, we can improve on, but I, but I think we have to kind of start accepting the mindset that there's not going to be a great difference between employees solely based on that tenure and, and number of years of, of service. If I may, Mr. Mayor. Please. Uh, certainly want to make sure we can see the improvement as we move forward. I think it's important. So at least we can have improvement in, in that particular, um, as we move, you know, into the study and, well, hopefully the study will bring about some things to show that we can show some improvement being made with certain job, job classifications. But certainly I appreciate the fact that once we find out certain occupations and job classifications, et cetera, deem will warrant a certain dollar amount that we can make sure that we're taking care of those situations as we move along. And I appreciate that, you know, hopefully being the case. I won't be here though, but still, we, we, would, we hope it would be the case. Encouragement will go on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. I, again, I, you know, there is no silver silver sure, bullet that, that that will resolve that one. Um, hopefully, we can we can gain some improvement. But um, you know, we're in comparison to the past, we're we're going to probably be more compressed just because of the cost associated associated with trying to avoid that. Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Sean. Can you talk a little bit of, about, you said that there are efforts to, to make the city of Lakeland one of the best places to work in Central Florida. And I know you have, have talked with us about employee engagement and those initiatives. I just, I know this is a budget workshop and we're talking about compensation and that's an important piece. But how are we making sure that if there are other areas that might be incentivizing people to take other opportunities, whether it's faster advancement or culture or management style, how are we getting our hands around that to make sure that we're not solely focusing on compensation while missing other things that could be contributing to people leaving? 
Thank you, Commissioner. Great question. Um, and, and, you know, we've touched on it a, a little bit uh, previously, but, um, you know, I've, I've talked about at a commission me meeting recently the employment, uh, the employee engagement survey that uh, we currently have um, in the, the budget for this coming year. And, you know, that's a kind of a shift in the industry from the old satisfaction surveys to being more about engagement. And so we've already completed some things, surveys of the employees that have helped, like recently we did a communications survey. Survey and and we, we gleaned a lot from that in terms of how the employees want to be um, communicated with. Um, the, the, the meetings that I uh, talked about a moment ago that I've had, it, it's been phenomenal, the response that I've gotten and the ideas that our employees have to bring forward um, to, 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 to maybe improve the, the work environment and working conditions and make us competitive with not just the public sector, but in many ways the private sector. So, you know, examples would be things like, um, you know, maybe more flexible work schedules, you know, in some areas where it might make sense to work four tens and the employees might, you know, rather work four tens than, than your, you know, than the, the traditional, you know, um, uh, uh, five, you know, eights, um, uh, we, we, it might make sense to do that in some areas. Um, remote working is certainly an interest that many of the employees have, and, and we're looking at that and considering that. We're also looking at things for awards and recognitions and how might we better recognize employees who really, truly do a, a superior, you know, job. Not, not just a good job in, in the job that they're required to do, but when they go, you know, above and beyond or, or, or they come up with a, with a real solution, um, you know, what, what could we do? And, and we've, we've been working with the, the senior management team and, and talking with the employees about, you know, even the idea of, you know, could there be some time off? I mean, everybody wants a good work-life balance. And so, you know, could we award some time off when, when we've got employees who truly went ab above and beyond, you know, the call of duty, you know, whether, and I don't think it's, you know, it shouldn't be a great amount of time, but for instance, we did, you know, we offered two days as an incentive during um, COVID for those who would get the vaccine because at the time um, our health experts and the community were saying that the vaccines were, you know, lowering the severity of the symptoms. And so if, if we'll offer two days for something like that, why wouldn't we consider two days for those employees who are truly going above and beyond the call of duty? So we're exploring things like that um, to, to, try to, to try to get to a place where we want to be recognized as one of the best places to work, you know, in the Central Florida region. And so the employees have been very receptive and have given some really good suggestions a, a, about things that would, um, would hopefully help retain them. Thank you. That's helpful. And I would encourage us just to continue to uh, further those efforts and things you pull from those uh, employee meetings. And that's great to hear that you've been doing that. So look forward to hearing more of you know, the ideas and some of the things we might be able to implement that are innovative uh, for yes. the public sector. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, Commissioner Madden. It works um, perfectly with what Commissioner McC uh, McLeod was saying. Basically, when you're talking about, you know, the 10-year approach and just having these meetings with folks that, you know, if you've been here two years and you can do the same job as someone who's been here seven years, you know, as you're going into the best place to work and, you know, providing excellent services, I, I'm happy to see that we're pivoting more towards, n away from a tenured approach to just you've been there longer, so you deserve more pay to do the same work as someone who's been there two years but then offering tuition reimbursement, letting them know that there's upward mobility in this city. And so to me, I think that parlays perfectly into when you're having tough discussions about you know, all the steps or how long you've been here, if you're frustrated with the approach or you're discouraged that you know, you've been here a long time and you're making the same as someone who's coming in, how about going back to school? How about checking out other opportunities within the organization that give you that upward mobility? You know, so I'm, I'm thinking that that's just conversations that we take for granted because that's what we do in the private sector. And so I'm happy to hear that with these dramatic numbers and changes, kind of government being disrupted, so to speak, and how we um, do our HR and pension plans and what's attractive to retaining and um, recruiting new people, 
that you are looking to other best practices and looking to the private sector. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Commissioner Matt. And if I may, to, to that point, I'd also like to add something because it's been very interesting, you know, in a lot of these meetings with the employees where I kind of went in thinking, all right, we're going to talk a lot about, you know, pay and, and benefits. I, I've been very surprised and pleased with a lot of the responses because some of the response has also, matter of fact, I, I would tell you that in the majority of the work groups that I've met with, some of what we have learned is that they want some skill type development opportunities training um, here at the city of Lakeland. Now, I will tell you, we have a robust training program, but what we're hearing from the employees is there's a perception and it's probably mostly accurate because we're hearing it multiple times that we do a real good job training supervisors, managers, and directors and, and above. But for kind of some of our frontline employees, who may be looking for just skills type training. You know, maybe they haven't had an Excel class since they were in college eight years ago, but Excel has drastically changed in the past eight years. And so an opportunity for them to go in and enhance their skills through some skills type training is something that they desire. And if we can provide that, if we can continue to hone their skills and make and, and put them in a place so that they can professionally develop and, and, and have an opportunity then for advancement, well, then I think that also certainly helps with our uh, retention efforts. Bet it does. And the employees who contribute those ideas are the employees who want to stay and they really want to have an environment that's thriving. And so responding to that is very, very important. Thank you. Good comments. Commissioner Reed. This may be really <clears throat> what is our vacation schedule? If, if, what's, what's the minimum and what's the maximum? Um, I may have to call on Mark or someone else. I, I, is it um, 12 days? I, I think 12 days when you're hired, and after five years it goes to, to three weeks? To, okay. And then after 15? Yeah. Goes to, after 15 years it goes to four weeks. Four weeks. Any other comments, questions? I stumbled through that one, Commissioner. I hope that came across clear enough. Do I need to recap that? I recap it. I had a hard time. time. So it, it. it's 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 twelve days. You know, when once you're hired, it goes to three weeks at seven years, and it goes to four weeks at fifteen years. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, twelve. It's it's really yeah. It's twelve days, fifteen days, and twenty days. Days. <laughs> See a lot of our senior management team shaking their head. I just want, are, are we in agreement on that? Or policy. we're in agreement? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs> our deputy city manager is pulling up the policy behind me, so she's verified it. Very good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on this? Very important part of this meeting. Okay. Next. All right, <clears throat> next what we're going to do is just, just talk about some of the enterprise funds and and how they look this year and, and the next couple years. Uh, of course, we've heard from Mr. Anderson with Water Wastewater. <clears throat> Lake Electric, uh, talking to Gina Friday, Gina Jacoby, uh, we anticipate fiscal year 22 ending with about 198 days cash, so 23, we're at about 174 days cash. Uh, Recognizing that, that we want to stay within the AA rating for Moody's, uh, their recommendation when we've been on those calls is they like to see us averaging at least 180 days. Um, so as you know, in June, uh, we started a rate case, and the, uh, that's about a four-month process. Coming back to you at the end of the year, uh, we'll have a discussion about uh, what, if any, changes are recommended to our rates. The last time we did this was, uh, I think, implemented in 2018, and that was an average of about a 3% increase at that time across the different rate classes. Okay? Parking, we, we tend to run fairly flat in surplus in parking. The capital associated with maintaining the different garages other than Iowa, which Lake Electric maintains, 
uh, is taken care of by the transportation fund. I will tell you that we, uh, we had initially set up the Heritage Garage to be fast-tracked and paid off by 26. That is still on plan. Once that is paid off, then the parking fund will get all of those revenues. Right now, we are taking those revenues and paying the debt down. So okay. once that occurs, starting in fiscal year 27, uh, they, will, they will get all of that, all of that money. Be, it's an interjection because you don't think you really want the surplus to be about zero dollars when in fact you know you have future needs coming along in terms of maintenance so that's good to know right right and and as we've talked the transportation fund, fund as long as i've been here has always covered the costs for the capital associated with the parking garages our parking fund could not ever generate enough revenues in surface lots parking fines and the parking space, long-term leases and parking garages to ever cover the cost of maintaining those garages. They're just very expensive. We're very fortunate that Mr. Beck approached us uh, about a public-private partnership with Heritage Garage, and we were able to partner up with the 411 spaces. So we are sharing an allocated share of the costs of Heritage with our partners with Aspire and with uh, Mid Florida and with the hospital, so that's been a tremendous, tremendous good fortune on the part of the city. Okay, we'd certainly be willing to consider another one just Absolutely. like it. Absolutely, and drop. We need <laughs> right. to do it soon. Right. Now you know how to do it. The, the 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 one the one caveat I have to that is the public improvement fund is not able to support that one yes, like sir. like it did with Heritage. So okay. the next one we may have to be a little more creative about finding a funding source for those spaces, but okay. we are uh, absolutely want to entertain all that we can hear. Uh, stormwater, uh, similar to what uh, Mr. Anderson talked about with uh, the commission adopting a three-year plan uh, for, for water wastewater rates that are revisited every year. The commission adopted the year before most all of you were here, except for commissioners Reed and Walker, uh, adopted a five-year plan for stormwater, recognizing the needs uh, the TMDL requirements, the, the requirements that come down from the state and other agencies uh, regard, regarding the maintenance associated with all of our, our, our lakes as well as drainage. Those have been 5% a year. Uh, it was decided uh, that we would not raise the 5% uh, the one year that we were recognizing potential uh, economic challenges during COVID. So that was extended one year, and so this year will be the last year of the initial 5% increases. I will tell you that uh, Lori Smith and her team with, with uh, Greg James and, and Heath do not have any 5% increases shown in the next five years in their, in their CIP because what they wanted to do was evaluate it this, the, this year and make sure they can come back with a reasoned request, if necessary, for rate increases in the future. They didn't want to just have a blanket, well, we did five each year, let's do it again. No, it's what do we really need, what is forecast? So, so for now, no projected growth in there, but likely based on what we've seen, there will be something, but it'll be a measured request backed up with good data. Nice. Okay. Airport, uh, you, airport is one of the agencies that we've been able to, to have in front of you on a regular basis between Mr. Uh, Conrad and then with Chris as well. Uh, we've, we've shown some, some tremendous growth. Uh, so the airport is, is, has a very healthy surplus, uh, a little over a million dollars right now with anticipated growth. They are estimated at 100% occupancy uh, right now, I think is what we're running. Uh, through through all the different uh, different leases that they have, from land leases to to the space leases. Yes, sir. Commissioner Reed. Thank you. I was riding around out the airport the other day, and and I guess they're getting the uh, roundabout started out that way. On, and, and I think it'd be nice if we could get some funds together to have something go in the middle of the roundabout. You know, before it gets too built, at least put the infrastructure in for electricity or something like that uh, have some funds but uh, it'd be you know that's our corporate 
first place they come in off the airport and the airport's going, if we could do something in the roundabout. That Is this an art request? Like a big LED sculpture? <laughs> well, yeah, some, something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Look at that. Does you Bill Reed want to spend money on art? <laughs> But uh, something that, you know, and I think we could get donors to do corporate, no, but here, sure. you, here you are, Lakeland, these are the corporations that are here, and I don't think it would take our total funding, but there again, I maybe Chris has Just got something some, to... Y'all may have some money laying around, or... Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to see something that the city contributes, 100,000, something like that, I don't know, but uh, a number. <laughs> But that's just, uh, I think, wow. we need to do the absence of frugality. You've heard it we need to do it now while they're doing it so we can get the power there and stuff without having to tear it up something twice. So, without minimizing your request, I appreciate you bringing that up. That's excellent. Me too. Sure, certainly. Chris, if you would come to the microphone, please. That way the public can hear you. Thank you. That we've been talking with Amy um, Wigan, Wiggins, Amy Wiggins. Yep. 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 with the chamber, and we're talking about adding some money to, to some sort of art in that roundabout. That's been a discussion that we've had. It's not budgeted this year, but we were talking about future, putting some sort of statue in the center of that or some sort of, some sort of figure of something. We were thinking about doing the kid with the airplane or something like that. Airplane in it, I would think. It should have an airplane sure, in it. Sure, it would be. <laughs> it should have an airplane. It would be a great poker it, piece, and it not having it in, it. <laughs> and not having it in this fiscal year works because by the time they get it done, it would be in the next. Fiscal I think year. if we could get some power there or something anyway, or water for right. irrigation and stuff, at least initially. Infra that infrastructure. That would be infrastructure. <laughs> sure, that's going to be in that center. We'll talk with the construction yeah. folks yeah. on that with the with the uh, the county. Mr. Mayor, if, if I could, yes, please, while, Walker. While, while, while she's up, um, the uh, ribbon cutting for the new restaurant was, and Commissioner McCauley did a very good job with, you. you know, representing the city, of course, and the mayor of absence. But being in attendance there as well, um, I tell you, the restaurant is the bomb. Good, good food. And, you know, and I'm sure, uh, Chris, you can share if you wish, but... It was very nice. They're done. Again, hats off to Commissioner McCauley and, and what with the river cutting and all. But even the signage out there now, we're having Waco, you know, kitchens there. And it's, and I'm just picking back on what, you know, of course, Commissioner Reed has already shared. And it's good to know something is forthcoming for the roundabout kind of situation. But it was very nice. Very nicely done. Very upscale kind of a place. I thought, wow, you know, here at the airport. So, very good job that you all, and even with remodeling, you all getting done in your own uh, office Front suite space. area for the for the uh, airport office office uh, expansion or redo is, is coming along well as well. What's funny is out at the airport, there's when the public calls, there's two questions: one is airline service, two is when's the kitchen or when's the restaurant going to be open? Yeah. 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 Well, we got one of those answers. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> make sure anything share else that. on the airport. All right. Thank you. Is the restaurant open to general public now? It will be in a couple of weeks. Okay. They'll start with lunch. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to slip on to solid waste. Uh, solid waste uh, continues to be in the lower quartile uh, compared to its peers. Its, its peers uh, is a list of 10 other agencies uh, across this area uh, from Polk County, uh, Bartow, Kissimmee, Winter Haven, uh, let's see, uh, Largo, Dunedin, Ocala, Plant City, Temple Terrace, and Tampa. Those have been the agreed upon comps that we've used over the last number of years. And so we're in a very good position. And we actually are very comfortable that, barring any emergencies, we don't foresee any type of increase in, in uh, rates in the next three to five years. But we evaluate that every year. CRAs are, are all in a very good spot. They're able to, they've gotten some good surpluses, uh, healthy surpluses over the years with the increase in, in growth, but they're doing a very good job of, of using and spending those accordingly. 
uh, to where we're not seeing a, a large <coughs> surplus growth. They're spending it, which is very important. Okay. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, when did the CRA sunset? When do they sunset? 31 for, 31 for Dixie Land in downtown. No, Dixie Land in Midtown, and then 34 for downtown. Is that right? 35. Oh, 35. Yeah, sorry. I was 35. All right. Um, this would probably be a good spot to take a break in if we could. Yes. And and one of the things I have been encouraged by our communications. Uh, facilitator and all this, Andrew Gash, is that we make sure we speak into the mic and only one of us can ever make noise at a time. <laughs> so wait sure, that, make sure somebody else is done before we start uh, talking, which is good habits anyway in communication. <laughs> so let's do that. So how long can our break be? 10 minutes? About 15. 15, 15. is perfect. Just to, one other thing yes. we remembered from last time, the mics stay hot. Yes. So if, if you're going to have conversations, you may... Just remember your mic stays hot. Why are you looking at me, Mike? No, no. <laughs> Look it around, ma'am. Look it around. So, Mr. Mayor, would okay. five minutes after 10? Would five after 10, we'll come back. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you. Turn your mic off. No, you can't. Okay.
Um, that brings us to the estimates you were going to provide, sir. That's good. Good morning again. <clears throat> so you've, you've seen this slide a number of times over the years. This is our day's cash estimate as of uh, today. This is with the current millage of 5.4323 mills. As you can see, we anticipate finishing 22 with 117 days cash. Uh, by 25, we are getting closer to what I like is, is what I'm comfortable with as a top end of, of days cash, which is about three months days cash on the top end. Um, <clears throat> Also mention what this includes within it. It's, it's all the assumptions that we had. Thank you. That's all the assumptions that we had recognized in on the first slide. <clears throat> the 14.66 percent in value growth, uh, the 5 percent health insurance, the across the boards that we've talked about for those eligible in the in the general in the general fund, uh, as as well as the growth um, of two and a half percent max. For, for those controllable costs. Good. Questions about this slide before we pop on to the next one. Okay, every year uh, we, I think it's important to at least show you what the day's cash would look like if in fact we were to consider a, the rollback rate. Remember the rollback rate is, is what millage would you have to charge uh, to generate the same revenues in 23 that you generated in 22 for property taxes, okay? So what you'll notice is unlike uh, the prior slide where we ended 25 with about 95 days cash, we would be at about 65 days cash. So uh, I would really encourage you to look at the, the, the variance in days cash between 24 and 25, that's what I always want you to look at, is how fast are we dropping because that then tells you what to expect the following year or two. Okay. With that, unless there's any questions about that slide, uh, I'm going to switch it back over to city manager and let him talk about the... Oh, yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. So when we're looking at the... 24 or 25, that is, that's still hypothesizing because we could still have property value increases. We still could have other factors that we can't. Absolutely. Okay. That's, that's right. So yeah, whether, right. whether we're looking at the first slide I showed you with the current millage, right. we're, we're just assuming 4% growth in each of those years because we just don't know. Well, and I was just sort of, I was saying that for the public at large to understand that that's not a cast in stone number. Oh, not at all. So even while we're making a game plan together as commissioners, that that is something that's going to fluctuate and be fluid. Absolutely. Um, so you don't have to feel trapped necessarily by those days. You obviously don't want them lower than a certain point, but we're still guessing at that point. Sure. We are, we evaluate it throughout each year and update our own sheets throughout each year as, as we get more good information. Thank yes, you. Yeah, good, good clarification. Mr. Thank Music. You. Yes, um, thank you, Mike. Is there, like when we're talking about the LE and their days cash on hand for ratings and stuff like that, where do we, from a, a rating agency, where do we need to be at days cash on hand to have, you know, have the, the rating that we're looking for? Is that? For the general fund? Correct. It's, it's, what we look at is not just the general fund because there's there's okay. we have uh, ratings. Water and wastewater has their own rating. But they're separate. Okay. Yes, Lake and Electric has their own rating, and then the rest of the city has its own rating. So the general fund is the biggest part of that with with days cash, and the rating agencies will absolutely look at what your general fund days cash okay. is. But they also take into account all the revenues and expenses and and surplus for the airport for solid waste, those that don't have their own rating as part of the general government's ratings. So, but the, the comfort level, though, isn't just where, where you're looking and saying, boy, three months on hand starts to get really tight. So, I mean, is there, is there a number that they're looking at and say, listen, if we go below this, we really are jeopardizing? Actually, our range is we'd prefer on the low end to be 45 to 60 days cash on hand. Yeah in the third year out mm -hmm. is on the low end when we really want to be mindful of decisions we're making going forward to avoid any type of millage increase in the out years. 
okay? So the lower threshold is 45 to 60 days in the out year. I'm just saying on the upper end, I, I would not, I think it would be too much to simply say, hey, let's try to keep it at 120 days or 115 days or 100 days. If we can keep it in that range of you know 45 to 60 on the low end, and then the upper end, if we can be in the 90s by the third year out, I think that's very appropriate. Again, being mindful of how fast we're spending down between the second and third year out. Yeah, I would. Which, which is a very important point that Mike just made because it does become real easy to look at the day's cash slide and focus in on on the number under each year, but 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 between each year and the and and the and the uh, and the amount that it's it's dropping is as equally important. Certainly, yeah. I think the big difference for us is that these numbers really are governance in terms of rate of, of spend, whereas 180 days for an LE is moody in terms of the rating to be applied. So this, this is more our driver than it is an extra. Yeah, and I guess my question was geared more towards when they're doing that and you're looking at something like the LE, like the bond that we did, are they taking into consideration, which I would imagine they would, the city as a whole as well, or are they not? They do for one factor, and that is if they're looking at water or uh, water wastewater or they're looking at electric, they look at our actions as related to those utilities. So if, for example, uh, we decided in a year that we wanted to avoid a millage increase but we wanted to raid the dividend, they take that into account across the country. That, okay. to them, is very important. They look at that factor. They do not they, – they will – uh, they'll ask us for our financials, but they do not factor that in anything more than they're just looking for anything that's outstanding or, or material that may concern them with the general fund or, or any of these others. But for the most part, if Gina Jacoby is providing the financials for Lake and Electric for that rating, that is the focused driver. They're enterprise fund focused and focused on our reinvestment and future strategy in those regards. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to um, Commissioner Music's uh, question, uh, from historical perspective, I think we, uh, as a commission, some years ago, I, I can recall even when uh, former Commissioner uh, Edie Yates was like our finance kind of go-to person on, on the commission, we as a com uh, commission adopted in some respect, making sure, as Mr. Brozart just alluded to, 45, 60 days, in the general fund, we just, just that's what we want to make sure we did not go below by the time that third year out, you know, with, with, as you see those numbers reflected. So I think that's been a good thing that we've just done and, and been able to keep that going for years and making sure that we kept that number, I mean, that, those number of days available as far as cash on hand. And, and I think that's important back to something that Commissioner Madden asked about um, when talking about uh, the emergency, the, the hurricane or something like that. What we do is we spend cash very quickly. Uh, and, and you know, whether it's overtime associated, parks, recreation, uh, solid waste, we make sure there's a lot of cash there because they are spending a great deal of money uh, bringing in someone else to help with picking and, and, and those types of things. So the cash is a big part of how we avoid uh, long interruptions of any magnitude in our service levels. So. Okay, any other questions on these couple of slides? Then we'll slip back over to Sean. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, there were kind of four areas that we needed to talk about related to operations that um, were discussed when we were at our strategic planning retreat back in February. And so it's no surprise that public safety uh, is, is one of those areas where we do have some operational um, needs that the commission has heard about and staff has continued to work on how we would propose addressing those needs. And, and so we'll start by talking about the Lakeland Fire Department and the level of service that is being provided by the fire department. You will recall at the strategic planning uh, meeting where the, the chief talked about um, the calls for service 
and the response times associated with those calls. And from that data, there was a, a, a pretty clear indication that um, because of growth, um, and specifically in, in the north area of the city, um, there was a need or is a need for a new fire station to be added somewhere you know, north of I-4. Along with that would include the, the 12 uh, firefighters that would be needed to, to meet the um, staffing levels to go along with a new station, um, you know, debt service on the station, and uh, the, the equipment and vehicles uh, necessary for that station as well. Um, we have talked about in the past ARPA workshops about the ability to fund the vehicles and, and the equipment um, using the, the, uh, the good fortunes of the ARPA funds to help with that. And so um, that discussion really uh, has not changed at all. The, the data that you saw in the discussion with um, Chief Riley um, still uh, indicates that need. And so we are uh, proposing or recommending uh, the addition of the station uh, and, and the firefighters um, and vehicles and equipment to go along with that. So that is uh, the recommendation based on fire. Um, it might be easier before I move on to uh, the discussion about Lakeland Police Department uh, to pause here for any um, questions. I, I, I can tell you, and Chief Riley is, is with us if there's any questions, but uh, we're in concurrence on um, the request and, and the need and, um, and, our, and our request that uh, this be a part of the uh, fiscal year 23 budget. Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and sure, I know we had a discussion in our earlier uh, meeting with strategic planning and all, um, and certainly appreciate the fact, you know, that we all know public safety is, is, is our number one, you know, go-to, making sure that we have what's needed to make sure our citizens and our residents, of course, of our city are taken care of properly, but and I, I thought that in, the, in that particular discussion, had we found or landed on a piece of property? I, 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 that's my question because even with the dollars that we, we won't be able to expend or fund to support what the ask is from our fire department, which of course I'm in favor and, and respect of that, but have, have, we found, have we found land yet? I thought that was a questionable situation at the time. Uh, we've, we have not um, entered into any contract on any property, but we have identified some potential sites where a station could potentially be constructed. It would require the acquisition of land, and so included in the, um, in the, the requested budgeted amount is an estimation for uh, the acquisition of property. And also, in, if, I, if I may? Also, in, 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 in respect to that, because we know Station 3 being the, uh, I guess, the largest one we would call them calls for emergency sake, uh, were, has those considerations been taken? And maybe Chief would need to uh, share this, uh, maybe answer this. Taking consideration with Station 3 still having the number of uh, calls when it comes to emergency uh, needs, especially with that area, of what we call our northern uh, boundaries of our city, where all the senior facilities are located primarily, seeing as it is. Are we taking consideration in challenges with Station 3? <clears throat> station 3, what's going to happen if we go with new Station 8? It will be 8, yes, 8. Moving out further north. Good morning, good morning. Yeah, for the record, Doug Riley, Fire Chief of uh, the Fire Department. Um, so the question about Station 3. Station three, and we and we covered this in the in the previous um, discussion. Station three is by far our busiest station, and and our 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 issues at station three are not only response numbers but response times, going from station three all the way out north 98, and getting there in a timely manner. Plus, north of I four, we're looking at nearly 4,000 calls a year. So that that's the two things that we're looking at there. So. To build Station 8 and open it tomorrow takes 18 firefighters. We're asking for 12 because today, as you all may know, we have two rescue trucks at Station 3 because of the number of emergency responses that are yes. running to divide that out. So that second rescue truck would be relocate to Station 8 to make up the other six or the other uh, six firefighters that we're needing to cover six per day for the 24-hour shift. So those numbers somewhere in the uh, neighborhood of about 6,500 calls a year that Station 3 is running now are going to be roughly cut in half. 
And so that, so, so the number of calls at Station 3 are going to be drastically reduced when we open up Station 8. And then those 6,500 calls are going to be divided instead of between three units. Now they're going to be divided between four units, and it's going to greatly um, reduce our response times, particularly in those areas north. The last question, I believe, uh, Mr. Mayor, would be thinking in terms of what you just mentioned, Chief, and with three and eight, but certainly we're seeing growth even more so northeast. You know, as we look at all the apartment units coming out of there. I don't, I don't know how many of you all drive that area quite, uh, quite frequent. Well, Station 6 is there, I know. Do you see or do you have uh, any comments you can make about our north Lakeland? Would it be 3, 8, and 6? Are we, you think we prepared with 8 to take care of even some growth that we may see coming in northeast even more? with all the growth of the development in that area, or, and of course the university being right there at, 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 at that particular area? To answer your question, if I understood it correctly, so, and, and to go back to our presentation, we're looking at North Lakeland, we're monitoring Northeast, and we're also monitoring Southwest. Today, the way we stand today, there's really not a whole lot of growth in Northeast. You got the college, and the college is expanding, and we got sun tracks, and there's a lot of like ideas or you know future horizon um, plans for stuff out there, but it's not happening today. So we're not seeing a lot of run volume out there. The bulk of the run volume that we're seeing in the northeast area is going to be west of 33 and all that industrial that's just booming out there. But we're still getting to that location from stage six in a pretty in a timely man manner that we're comfortable with. So once we start going east of 33 and out toward the college. Then we start looking at long response times, and we're going to be outside of the five miles, so we're going to be looking at an ISO issue once we get to that point today. I, I think it's probably not an issue for the college, the ISO, because they're, they're self-funded, or they're self-insured, I should say, so it's not really an ISO issue for them. But once they start building around there, then it's going to be an issue. It's not happening right now. We, we will watch it very closely, just like we're monitoring Southwest Lakeland very closely, and we, everybody knows how much growth is going out there with all the residential developments and thousands and thousands and thousands of additional houses. So we'll com continue to monitor those and we'll make, we'll make recommendation, recommendations ahead of time so that nobody's blindsided with that. And yeah, th those are horizon issues that we'll just continue to watch. Thank you. It's 12 now becomes 18 long term. Yes. So it'll, it'll be 18. But those other six are relocating from three to eight. Right. Yes, but but it's twelve new positions. Yes, so it's not it's not phased in, Mr. Mayor. It's not twelve Sorry. and then six yeah. to come later. Yeah. We yeah. have the six. Right. Sorry, uh, Commissioner Reed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief, for being here today. Um, on Station Three, are we have more calls for fire or more for EMS? Well, EMS at every station. If that's always the case, you think? Uh, roughly, it it. it Varies a little bit, but it runs about 78% of our calls are EMS calls. Yes, sir. Um, I know we recently sold some land to Polk County for a EMS right there on 33. Will that uh, reduce our burden some? Uh, not really. It's, it will help with, because that will be a, a county ambulance station, and so it's going to help those residents in that area getting a transport unit there faster, but it's not really going to reduce our calls at all. So, it, okay, because I didn't know it, how it, it very well could reduce our own scene time. Right. Because if we get there first today, and that patient's ours until the ambulance gets there and we transfer care to the ambulance, so it could very well reduce response times for the transport unit, and it could reduce our own scene time, yes, sir. I didn't know how that works. It seems like if we're side by side and everybody goes and only one person have to go versus two or something, I don't know. But uh, that, that was a really good location for them. It wouldn't help us because it's station six right there and it's just not in the right location to help us with our response times and to divide up those calls. So, and it, the, the property wasn't big enough for what we needed either. So, I mean, when we were approached with that, it was, I think it made sense for us to partner with the county on that particular location. The next question I have is for you, how much have we got budgeted for land acquisition for that site? I will tell you that we have 800,000 set aside in the impact fees. Uh, but we've factored the total cost of construction as well as additional monies associated with that as a little over $4 million 
for construction as well as as additional additional purchase and and then we'd borrow for that which is the debt service which is included in the in the 1660 there okay so, yes sir okay so we're looking about four four million dollars total package it's actually we've got about 4.8 set aside worst case scenario for between uh, land purchase and because we don't know if it's land that's going to need to be remediated we just we just don't know it's about an acre and a half I think we were looking, we we're trying to find more something around three acres. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. But by them moving to eight, a, a, a new eight rather than a relocated three, the cost for land dropped considerably because they didn't have to be right on 98. That's helped us a lot in the cost associated with that of land purchase. Good. Commissioner Madden. Okay, so the ARPA funds is going specifically to vehicle purchase, not towards any of the construction costs. Because isn't it that you can't use it for con ARPA? Is not um... for new. The undesignated monies can be used for capital. Okay, and we right now we have about 2.9 million in undesignated. What we have found is, if in fact down the road you decide that you're going to fund a fire truck and vehicles for and equipment for 30 police officers over time, the day's cost is about $2.9 million. So theoretically, the, all the vehicles and equipment would be purchased with the undesignated ARPA monies if you so desire. If not, that's got to come out of a, a millage, but we're trying to avoid that because that's, those are one-time costs. If we can cover those with ARPA, it's less of a millage requirement for, for the citizens. Okay, so you already know. Yes. Thank you for clarifying yes, that because I know it's time sensitive with regard to when it's spent. So I just that's correct. And we're and we're watching that if for some reason down the road you decide that you're going to fund you or a future commission decide that you're going to fund less than all the personnel to use up those monies. We absolutely are going to be on it annually to to raise our hand and say uh -huh. you have unspent monies of X. So we, we, that'll be addressed annually, as as you dictate. Anything else, uh, Commissioner Music? Yep, yeah, uh, Mike. If you wouldn't mind, walk me through that again one more time. The the amount that the total of the project minus what we have, and then what we're going to be borrowing. Because um, I know we had set some money, or at least talked about setting some money aside for land purchase. Yes, there's eight hundred thousand. That was the eight hundred thousand. Yes, sir. That's then, in the uh, those come from impact fees, and that's okay. actually in the public improvement fund. Impact right. fee oh, monies yes. from the okay. fire will that flush. That was eight hundred thousand. Yes, sir. Okay. Right, and we've got approximately four million set aside or identified, not set aside, right. identified uh, as as construction costs. But it's a combination of you know if if we have to ve the project value engineer the project down a little bit because the cost of of uh, the the land is a little more than than what we anticipated, then we we address that. Okay. So we're uh, you know ballpark construction, getting the land, getting the uh, getting it furnished, is about four point eight million dollars total. And Chief. then the fire truck is funded from the ARPA. Market. Right. That's yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm yeah. So when we're talking about you know the land that we need and and. Uh, it was interesting because I had actually read your father's book and he was talking about <laughs> development and he said, you know, you always buy three times what you think you need, right? Because as you go, you're always going to have. But but I live right down from uh, the Beacon Station on Beacon, South Florida, and that's a postage stamp. You know, so are, are we saying three acres because we're just over guessing, we're over, I mean, because when we, when we start talking about more land, that's there's fewer opportunities for larger chunks of land. So how do we identify the actual land usage that you guys are looking for? We looked at Station 6. Station 2 is not a good example because it's such, it's such a <laughs> yeah. tight area there. Yes, it is. It, it serves its purpose. It and does. We, I'm we glad get the to be 400 done. yards from it. We started with Station 6. <laughs> started with Station 6 and the footprint there, and we tried to take into account having a little extra room for a third bay for future growth. We don't want to have to do it after the fact. And then also, if, if we're able to get to where we can do something for LPD for a substation. We would like to have enough room gotcha. there to be able to do that. But that, you know, that would be okay. a separate conversation. 
but we got to <coughs> first and foremost got to have enough room uh, enough land to be able to incorporate that okay. into it and, you know other things we have to kind of anticipate would be for instance if we have to have you know on-site stormwater retention so you know when you're talking about three acres it includes you know accommodations for that if needed if if you're in a situation and find a property where that's not needed then it could potentially be a smaller, you know, spot. smaller than okay. the three thank you Commissioner McCarley, did you have oh. uh, Commissioner Thank you. And I may be out of turn, I don't know, but um, I see uh, Brian is here today. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I know there's some uh, rezoning and stuff going on up that area, and there may be some sites within that rezoning that may be compatible. Have we talked to those folks about set asides up there uh, north of I 4? We have had those discussions, Brian. If you want to, you want to come up and address some of that. But we're, we're, we, we, yes, Commissioner, in anticipation of that, we we know that there might be an ability to um, negotiate a, a, a location. I'm confused. I, I need. I, I hate confusion because that's, that's the work of the. It's interview. hard to negotiate in public. I'm well, not confused. <laughs> no, it's just, I'm confused because I thought I heard. You mentioned, Mr. Mr. City Manager, that possible site had you're looking at. So when we have a discussion now about sites, I thought you said you already had a possible site or something that you're looking at. Am I saying we have wrong? potential sites identified? Okay, that's what I want to make sure I heard. Thank you. Morning. Something we don't want to discuss today, then. Yes. It's hard to negotiate in public. <laughs> yes. yes. Just saw Palmer move the mic to his face, so I'm I'm going to defer I, I, to him I briefly. With that. I mean, there are negotiations going on with different sites, but uh, this probably isn't the best place for that. I just want to make sure Brian was in the loop, and we made sure that we Pl plugged in <laughs> fully. I, I, I'm going to draw my question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, Brian. However, I mean, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Oh, not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I feel safe adding. Okay, all right. <laughs> Ambiguity kind of adds to what I, the question I was going to ask, but we are confident, we believe we will need these funds in this fiscal year for the land agreement, purchase, whatever that is, correct? I mean, it's not so far out that, right. So correct. That otherwise, it wouldn't be in this. That's request. correct. That's correct. We yes. wouldn't okay. bring it now if we didn't think we were going to need it now. That's okay. correct, sir. Yes. Just for clarification. <laughs> Good question. Good Any questions? others? All right. Any other? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Brian and Chief Riley. Um, the next part, then, moving on to the next part of the discussion, we'll talk about the Lakeland uh, Police Department and the level of services um, there. And again, kind of thinking back and remembering back to the strategic planning session that we had, you heard a presentation from uh, Chief Garcia that talked about, you know, utilizing some uh, nationally recognized models to, to predict or determine, you know, the, the number of police officers and, and other positions needed um, to provide a level of service that, um, you know, is, is acceptable and, and safe for the community and so you you'll remember a discussion about um, up to 31 police officers and, and other uh, positions and you know that is in those models it, it also you know determines or predicts you know some level of of growth population growth and so, you know, we, we know, of course, that over the last, you know, few years, we've had rapid growth. And, and when you have more people living in the community, you need more police officers to be able to keep your response times, you know, to the calls for service uh, at that acceptable level. You know, but what, what we don't know is we don't know, kind of similar to Commissioner McCarley earlier when she talked about those out years um, in the day's cash, you know, we don't know what our continued level of growth will, will be in this community. We, we expect it will be somewhat strong but but we don't know that for sure and there's already some signs of that slowing um, I, I read recently from some reputable sources where you know in the residential real estate market right now um, in May there uh, for residential properties that were listed for sale 60% of them had multiple offers and so there was a bidding war 
uh, of 60% of properties listed for sale. In June, that dropped to approximately 55%. In July, it's now down to 28%. So quite a significant drop off from you know, June to July. And we don't know what that will look like moving forward for the coming months or even the coming years. And so with that in mind, you know, we're, we've, we've tried and worked on, staff and, and, and chief has worked on, you know, trying to determine, you know, what would be a phased in approach. And, and so the recommendation today is based on that. It's, it's based on the idea of a phased in approach. And as you can see on the overhead, um, that, that would start with, in this budget, 13 uh, positions is what is recommended. Um, I will, you know, tell you working with chief, um, that's, that's my recommendation as, as the city manager and, and, and our chief Garcia has uh, concurred with that for now. Now, what that also though anticipates is, you know, with 13 and, and knowing that we were started off talking about 31, well, definitely that means that it's likely in future years, we're going to need to add more positions as well. But it, it, we want to start with the, with the biggest number here of 13 because we've already experienced the growth. You know, what has helped us with adding uh, this 13 is also, as was discussed, you know, over the last several years, we, we've averaged 15 to 20 positions at the police department that were not filled. Well, now they're, they're, they're filled, or at least closer to being filled. And, and so the addition of, of that headcount or filling those positions, I should say, not it wasn't an additional headcount, but filling the existing table of organization has also helped with our response times for those calls for services. So adding another 13 now will help us manage what we've experienced in terms of rapid growth, and then it will allow us in those future years to evaluate that and see how many more we need to add in each of those years. Obviously to get to 31 or, or, or 30, because that has even changed slightly, um, you know, you're looking at then uh, potentially four or five per year if, as it was suggested earlier, we want to be able to provide for vehicles and equipment utilizing the ARPA funds because that has to be expended by December of 2026. So between now and 2026, we, would, we could evaluate each year adding another four to five headcount to, to take care of the growth that we've experienced and growth moving forward, however rapid or less rapid that may be. So that's the recommendation uh, at this time would be for um, a staffing level addition at Lakeland Police Department of 13 positions. We'll stand for questions. And the equipment would be covered for those 13 by ARPA. That's correct. And then in future years out to at least December of 26, adding headcount could also have the vehicles and equipment covered by ARPA, which is why that's kind of the range of time to escalate up over time to somewhere near the 30 that uh, the models have predicted and has been supported by our police chief. Excellent. So I see Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Qu quick question, and the chief may need to come up if, if, if we could, uh, Mr. City Manager, just to make sure that I'm, I want, my question is being asked, been answered uh, that I'm asking. You know, we had a challenge in our city, I'm going back a few years ago, because we failed to continue to keep certain officers in certain areas of our city. And that was our NLOs, Neighborhood Liaison Officers. Well, we, after the challenge came and we dealt with the challenge, we then, of course, put those, those officers back, you know, in those neighborhoods. It's considering population growth, and most of it, of course, is southwest, I, I, I would say, in addition to some further north at this point. Um, will we still have our NLOs, or we, we still going to keep NLOs in strategic areas to support that? As, I just want to make sure we don't lose out and go back and have to repeat. Uh, that's my question, first question. The second question is, because of the growth you say we're experiencing, and you asked for 31, city manager is saying 13 is where we can start and build from that point forward. Do you believe that that kind of, um, I guess, uh, uh, um, approach, yes, thank you, Mr. Commissioner Music, would be reasonable with what we're experiencing and the service levels 
that our people here in our city would expect? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Ruben Garcia, Chief of Police. Uh, it's certainly a uh, well-measured, phased-in approach, and it allows us to seek uh, quality as well as quantity of officers, and that's very important that we hire the right people. So that gives us an opportunity. We can estimate anywhere from five to ten uh, retirements, resignations throughout the year, so we'll know we'll have to hire those as well. So that 13 plus that five or ten, you know, you're, you're in the 20-range ballpark. Yes. That's a pretty big ask for our small staff that does the hiring in a one-year time. So uh, I think that's a well-thought-out plan. And uh, the NLOs would certainly not change. We would uh, keep them in those neighborhoods. We've found uh, great use for them, and, and they've helped in a lot of different ways. And a lot of times they're more than just that neighborhood officer, but they're kind of our fire teams, if you will. When we have special projects come up, they get dispatched to those that relieve the patrol and the detectives from having to worry about those. So uh, we certainly want to continue to uh, build upon that unit and what good stuff they've done already. My last question would be, as we move forward, as especially with public safety being the number one ticket for all of us, um, and Fire Station 8 coming to fruition, do you see where, as you as was mentioned in our strategic planning, that we can have possible a a substation for police, because you know where downtown is now relative to where North Lakeland is continuing to go further north. You see that uh, being viable and supportive? Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, just the mere travel time, uh, you take an officer way up in the north section of the city to travel back to the station to do station business that they could do at a substation. You're talking about hours of manpower savings by doing that, so it would certainly as well as it brings that kind of neighborhood uh, police uh, mm -hmm. in, into the neighborhood yeah. so folks have an opportunity to come more of a, a substation type environment where they feel hopefully comfortable coming to talk to the police there. Thank you. Madden. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. I um, have a similar question uh, as to um, Commissioner Walker. Just go, you know, kind of with the same neighborhood police strategy that we feel was really effective. I know Commissioner Walker was, um, you know, really influential with the gang task force and all of that efforts, but then add to that school shootings and the efforts to put SROs more into every classroom. I know that when we first had those kind of mandates coming forward, we didn't have enough SROs mm -hmm. for all of our classrooms and had to work with the county on how to fill those positions to keep our uh, school safe. So my first question is with regard to SRO count with this um, new uh, request. And then the second question is, um, like the NLOs, to me, I feel like taking the PAL program, the restructuring from a citizen board, putting that back under LPD, knowing there's some, you know, constraints with the building, you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe the building's just fine and perfect. Um, but those are all, you know, highly important to me with regard to overall um, safety and security, investing in our children relationships in the neighborhoods, but also with those uh, children, uh, at-risk children in the PAL program. So. Uh, those are my, my two questions with counts are, do those counts take into consideration the SRO numbers and then also the PAL program funding with regard to staffing for coaches and also for um, the facility, the building? And then um, also you said that this would cover, the ARPA funding would cover vehicles and equipment. I'm assuming that that is including all the equipment that's coming in for body cameras. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's true. But we made an initial estimate on how much body cams would cost, and certainly with new uh, numbers, that would be um, taken into consideration. So that might be a moot point. I'm assuming that was rhetorical. But the SRO count and the PAL program are, um, if you could comment on that. Oh. Yes, uh, currently we have the high schools and the middle schools covered with SROs. The uh, elementary schools are covered by guardians mm -hmm. uh, with our officers uh, in and out of the elementary schools as time will allow. Of course, with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, most of those officers have to stay on the campus they're assigned. So there's a lot less flexibility as there once was to have a kind of a roving elementary school officer that we once enjoyed. Um, we, we will. In our original proposal, there was an extra SRO for that relief factor. Uh, now when an officer's down for a vacation or sick, we have to pull from uh, traffic or patrol to fill that. Uh, 
that that does put an officer in the school that's not used to that environment as well as take away from the manpower and the tasks that they were already assigned. So we'll, we'll work through that operationally to make sure that's covered. Is that SRO in this, this 13 or would it need to be 14? Uh, we did not have an SRO figured in this 13. Uh, okay. Are we sure? Okay. Are we sure? And then could you be sure? Okay. And then could you comment on the PAL program? Uh, the, there was for PAL funding. The, the, this was just uh, personnel. The, the request, we didn't have any requests for uh, uh, further PAL facilities. So you feel like our PAL funding is sufficient to be able to? Uh, no, ma'am, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, it, it is never sufficient because it, 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 it keeps enjoying its success and it keeps growing on itself, yes. which is a great thing. Uh, I think our guys and gals out there have done some great things partnering with some other folks. Uh, uh, FWC, they're par partnering with uh, Tenor Rock in order to keep that archery program going. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lakeland Square Mall has given them some storefront where they've done some after school and summer type programs up there. So it's busting at the seams, you're absolutely right, but they're uh, coming up with creative ways to expand that out in the community and still serve the children that need to be served. Any other questions on that? Commissioner Music? Um, yeah, and just for all of the uh, 115,000 uh, residents that are listening um, right now, the can you because acronyms i mean we're wearing these things all the time we right. hear acronyms right. so the the uh nlos and the uh, sros could you elaborate on what those acronyms are for the individuals so the, that don't uh, nlos know that? are the uh, neighborhood liaison officers uh they serve as our uh, problem solving community police unit uh assigned to the four quadrants of the city uh, seven days a week and they do just as their name would imply they liaison with the other units uh, throughout the department to bring the services that are needed to address problems in neighborhoods. Our SROs are our school resource officers, and they are assigned here in the city to the high schools and the uh, middle schools. And our again, our elementary schools are covered by the Guardian program. Well, a couple questions on that. Yes, on the so f the and, and I don't know how the legislation was written to 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 cover these, but when a school, um, you know, Kathleen High School, for instance, or Lakeland, when they're using a an officer that actually is coming out of your budget and not the school's budget does the school pay for any portion of yes sir the, the, uh, the public schools pay 75 percent of the cost of officers and equipment okay. uh, the private schools normally pay 100 percent of that yes okay and then uh, final question so we're looking at with with normal attrition and then with what we're looking to hire we're, we're talking about potentially 20 officers a year over the next couple of years and and you guys have done uh, you know, great job fishing outside of our local pond to be able to to bring in some new um, staff. Do you feel that you're going to be able to facilitate that number? Is there enough people out there that you're going to be able to hunt to come down here? And yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, but it, it is a topic. Uh, next month, I'm going down to speak to the uh, Florida Police Chiefs Association about our recruiting efforts and some of the things that we've done that's been successful for our group. But it is a question across the state and really across the nation, keeping police officers on the force. As a, as a correction, it's not 20 officers a year. It's going to be 13 this year, plus they have the 5 to 10 that they may have That's in terms of retirements. That's what it's but about. after that, it will be 4 to 5, plus those 5 to 10 okay. in retirement. Okay. So initially, but yes. Yeah, so. This is the big, this would be the big yeah. load. Okay. And it ties with the ARPA equipment at the same time yeah and that's a, that thank you for reminding me that because that was another question that i had you know we, we we talk about the the funding for uh you know vehicles and certain things coming through arpa and we keep talking about that that deadline right the 26th i mean does anybody here really think we're going to have a struggle spending that money mm. i mean i've never seen a, a an organization not be able to spend money as it can because we keep talking about it like We've got to spend it by 26. There's no doubt we're going to spend that by 26, right? We'll spend it. The question is, what's the most important strategic right, place the, the, to the, spend the, it? Yeah, the most prudent right. way to spend yes, it, but right, okay. Right. Yeah, with the biggest the impact. Big concern with, with spending it by 26 was if it was tied to outside agencies, it becomes a little more difficult to then ensure that those outside agencies are spending it. Absolutely. If you keep yeah. it in-house, exactly. for example, yes. water, wastewater, they can keep an eye on that to ensure that we are spending it in, in, yeah. in 
that's more, typically our that's need more is greater concern. than the funds one, that we have available. Yes, so sir. getting rid of money yes, isn't sir. usually a hard thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, I and, think that and, and we would the only place we would need to be real cautious about the timing of that would be once we get into twenty six. I mean, we would sure. need to order whatever you know vehicles and equipment would be necessary for whatever the number is in that year, so that we could expend it by the deadline. Certainly. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner McLeod. I had the same question as Commissioner Music at the end about the recruitment landscape, Chief, and you kind of answered it. I know in February you felt like it was it would be very doable to hire 13 plus new officers, and was just curious if that's still the case today. From what you're seeing, it sounded like it is. Yes, I, I certainly believe we can fulfill that. Okay. We don't want you to be too overzealous at the <laughs> session that you're teaching <laughs> <laughs> until you've got all your guys hired. No, yes, sir. That was tongue in cheek, but kind of. <laughs> um, any other comments or questions? The 13 officers are definitely staffed. You can figure out where they go, know exactly what you need, and you can go tomorrow week that there's a need for them. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, primarily the bulk of them will be put out in the patrol division where we're answering the 911 calls. Yeah, we'll help. Okay. Yes, Commissioner. That will help cure our response time that was what we know we need to be be done yes, putting sir. more and on the streets yeah that that would be definitely more a, on the streets to make a sure. move in the right spot yes okay. sir that's right okay thank you any other questions all right Thanks, chief thank you very much chief okay so um we only have when i when i mentioned the four items that uh definitely we knew we needed to address coming out of strategic planning we only have one other of those items remaining, but before we, we get to that, um, Mike is going to show you the impact to the day's cash based upon the recommendations that the commission just heard. Yes, it, and what we did was <clears throat> we tried to use some available cash if we could with, with the idea being we wanted to be in the 90-day uh, range by 25. And so if, in fact, you were to consider this proposal of 0.3326 mil increase, you'd still see a day's cash as, as displayed. Um, I will just, uh, one of the commissioners asked last week of the week prior during one of the one-on-ones what we had reduced the millage in the last four years, and it was 0.1321 mils was the reduction we were at 5.5644 mills five years ago, and then we've had two reductions that got us down to 5.4323 mills. So, so the net change over the last five years is slightly more than two tenths of a mill. Somebody had asked that question, so I just want to make sure that, that that's, that's clear, but the impact is 0.3326. Me your point, you're almost two. Per, uh, it, it, 0.3326 mil increase less what was <coughs> reduced over the last two years of 0.1321. It's a net new from five years ago of two tenths of a mil. Gotcha. It was just a question I'd gotten asked by two -tenths an S. someone, and I, I don't remember who it was. So, <clears throat> can you can you show us what the Days on cash <clears throat> would look like with a five point uh, four th two three two two three. Yes, bet you have a slide for that. Say, where's the spreadsheet? <laughs> <laughs> it's your call. Well, so here, this is up. This is the pleasure of the commission. Mike is prepared to show those things, and and we can walk through various scenarios. The thought was we would kind of get to the end where we turn it over to the commission to walk through those various options that you may want to review. So uh, it's up to you. We we can pull that one up now, but we're likely going to have others. I'll wait. Uh, I'll wait. Wait. Okay. We'll wait. And, let me add, yes, Commissioner Walker. Mayor, and it, it just does not take consideration anything else when I say that, right. meaning any other things that any of us may want to even have uh, have discussion <laughs> on. That's what's Am next. I that correct? That's what's okay. next. Correct. All right. So this is, so we have the first that assumed everything that we had been presented, okay. this that shows these two changes for public safety, right. and then we'll take a look at what the commission wants to consider. 
happened. And please understand, this shows just 12 and 13. This does not show right. if you decide during our talk after a while that you want to say, show me what it looks like if we add four or five or six two years out. I'll show you that it doesn't it doesn't include that. This only includes what we're talking about today. Okay. Okay. Yes. But but I that's I'm prepared to show you any of those things. I just yes, I couldn't anticipate where exactly we were we were going to go. As nor can we. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll go forward. Um, so then, what do we want to to do? That let's talk about. Um, so we can pass on having millage discussion at this yeah, point. At in time. this point, sure. is that all right with everyone? Okay. Okay, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, are we? There, there's one other discussion that I want to have with the commission before um, we get to the point of Mike presenting the um, maximum millage discussion, yes, um, and then the the options that you all might like us to plug in to take a look at. And, and that's just to address the other item that came out of um, strategic planning related to the future uh, management and operations at the RP Funding Center. And so I've had an opportunity to individually update each commissioner, but for um, information to the public uh, who, who are aware of that conversation, I just want to follow up with what has occurred related to that. Um, after uh, the commission at strategic planning, uh, you know, gave a, 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 a directive to um, take a look at what it might uh, look like if we were to bring in a management company to potentially manage the RP funding center, um, staff went to work on that request. And we were able to uh, prepare an RFP that was uh, somewhat difficult um, to do because it's not an RFP that's very common uh, across the country, but we did find a couple of RFPs um, using one of the national associations that um, some of the uh, uh, folks that we have in our um, purchasing uh, division are a part of, and, and also through uh, Tony Camarillo uh, with his connections uh, and, and his uh, service at the RP Funding Center. We, we located two. One was in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, and the other in Palm Springs, California. And so we convened a, a team of city staff to work on uh, putting that RFP uh, out there uh, for, for bid. Um, when, we, when we put the RFP out there, we sent it to over 372 uh, vendors who are registered in our iSupplier, and those are vendors that are in the professional services category, so not all 372 are specific to you know, management companies. So some of them may be, you know, catering companies or, um, y you know, graphic design related to, to a, a center like the RP Funding Center and others. Um, we did make sure and, and were careful to, uh, to specifically reach out to three companies in particular, two of which are two of the largest in the country, um, and one uh, who is uh, relatively close and operates out of the Tampa Bay area. Um, after putting the RFP out there, we did hold a um, non-mandatory pre-proposal meeting and site visit at the RP Funding Center, and we had four different companies who attended that uh, non-mandatory meeting. Um, two of those four were, were two of the ones that I mentioned are, the, are two of the largest uh, in, the, in the country. Um, we also uh, had purchasing receiving some questions from various different vendors, and that resulted in the city uh, issuing two different addendums that went out to the RFP so that everyone who had uh, asked questions or had interacted with us or attended the, um, the, the site visits, you know, they, they had all of the information, and that was equal among them. The result of all of that was um, we only had one submittal that was received related to the management uh, contract at the RP Funding Center. Um, once, and, and I will tell you that that one uh, has been uh, considered non-responsive. Um, they, they did not provide a, a scope of uh, work to be done. That's one of the major components of the submittal to the RFP. And I, it's, it's pretty clear that um, what was requested is, is outside of their um, scope of services that they could provide. Because we had only received that one response, 
I did ask that our um, purchasing department uh, to reach out to all of the vendors that interacted with us in any way during the process, whether they attended the on-site visit, whether they had contacted us with questions. I wanted to try to gauge if, if we could figure out why they did not respond, and, and we only received uh, the, the one that was, was not um, considered. Um, and so we did receive uh, good responses from, uh, from our research there, um, and, and most of them um, had responded that um, it, they, they just weren't big enough, they weren't a large enough company, they didn't have the resources to take on that type of, of, um, of management. The, the two largest that I've mentioned a few times now, they also responded. Um, they were very complimentary to the process. Um, they were very complimentary about the on-site visit and all of the information um, that was uh, received uh, by them when they asked the questions. And, and at the end of the day, their response was that it was a business decision on both of their behalf, and it was primarily because from the discussion that they were aware of and, and information provided, um, they felt like what the city is, is trying or attempting to accomplish financially was just too aggressive for them to achieve. And so they decided not to submit, and that was their response back. So with that, um, the, the plan moving forward and what has been included in the RP Funding Center uh, proposed budget is um, about six months of this next year with the RP Funding Center operating as it presently does. And that's because we have some uh, contracts that are already in place for different events that will occur at the RP Funding Center. But at the end of that six months, um, Tony Camarillo and, and, and other staff and, and the city manager's office have worked on a, uh, we're going to shift our, our business model. And um, we're going to move away from what we have historically done there, where we have promoted um, events uh, that the city promoted and took the risk on whether or not we would generate any revenue from some of those cultural and entertainment type events. And we are talking about things like the um, Broadway series and classic album live and, and things where even with a, a good attendance at times, we just, we don't, because of cost associated, we, we don't come out ahead in, in revenue. And so in our shift in the business model, we're going to be becoming more of a rental facility. Um, we're going to look for other promoters who will rent the facility and they will take on the risk uh, in terms of the return and profits that they would generate, which means it will become more of a convention type center, but there will still be um, cultural and entertainment events because there have been examples of of other acts that have come and rented the RP Funding Center. One most notably was Jerry Seinfeld, uh, who came and rented the facility, and he and uh, and his company took on the risk with that, you know, and, and, and it's up to them whether or not they, they generate the profit. So that's where we're going with the RP Funding Center um, based on the work that was done and the responses that we received. And um, the plan does project uh, to get us much closer to um, the request that we heard from the commission. Uh, we won't accomplish that in, in the first budget. Uh, it'll, it'll probably take us a, a couple of years to, to get as close as we can. The other part of that, which we've discussed previously is, you know, there's also capital debt that's associated with um, managing and operating the RP Funding Center. We would have had that couple that that capital debt even had we brought in a management company. The, you know, the, the roof needs for the facility, the, the chillers and the AC unit and the other things there that have to be maintained, many of which are scheduled soon and will need to be maintained. You know, we, we will have that, ex, that expense. So that's an update. I wanted to cover that one because it was a strong conversation at strategic planning. Uh, it was a great effort. Effort. All of staff that worked on that did a, did a really good job, and, and again, we received that response from those that we surveyed as to why they decided not to submit. So with that, Tony Camarillo is with us, and we'll take any questions if there are any related to it. Commissioner McLeod. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Sean, for the update. So just for clarification, the target that we talked about at strategic planning was somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars in terms of a, a subsidy from the city. Correct? Yes. Okay. And so you think that is, it's, it, with the changes operationally that you mentioned, um, it would take at least a year to get to that, possibly two, just trying to get a sense of that.
timeline and what that looks like. I'm going to ask Tony to come forward and he can discuss. So we'll only get half the benefit of what they're doing this year. Right. Right. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, Tony Campbell with the RP Funding Center. Um, to answer your question, Commissioner, uh, one of the things I mentioned when we had the the discussion about this last time is that we had in process, or we're working at like a 12 to 18 month calendar. So there's things on the books that we have to produce. And uh, that gets us through the middle of next year. And, you know, those cuts uh, and any other changes that we need to make would occur at that point. And then that would be, we'd start to see the bigger savings. Okay. I think I would love to see what that projection looks like in specific numbers. Just so if we, if this is our goal and this is where we're going, we know that here's where we project by this time, knowing there's some events and things that sure. will likely come our way that we don't know what those are today, we, but just so we are tracking that, so it's not a in two to three, maybe four type years. I think, I think the, the plan that we have set in place now in uh, not next fiscal year, we will we'll, we'll get closer next fiscal year, but the following fiscal year will get us probably very close to near that number you're looking at Okay. in the current plan. Okay, that's, that's helpful. And Commissioner, just for also point of clarification, I mean, when we're talking about the subsidy, we're talking about the operating subsidy. Again, to separate the capital expense, which sure. in a given year could, could exceed that just yeah, by itself. That's right. Okay. Right. Understood. Thank you. This is Commissioner McCarley. Um, I, I think I asked in our April one-on-one -on -one for kind of whatever the business plan or the business model looks like compared to the RFP. We had talked about like when you all put the RFP together, what that looks like. And I'm like, could I have something that I compare against that the RP is already doing? It's really confusing with RFP and RP. <laughs> but, um, you know, to Commissioner McLeod's point, I think not only would the forecasting numbers be helpful for me, but I would love to see the game plan in a presentation in a PowerPoint format that, that can be emailed to us or something that has your projections and what you're already doing. I'd like to compare it against what we've done in the past because I can't understand, like, where we're going if I don't know where we've been. Sure. Um, so that's something that I had referenced, I think, back in April, and then just to have it circle back, which that's on me for not asking for it again. But um, just if I could compare apples to apples, that would be really beneficial to look at the long game. Sure. We'll, Commissioner, we'll provide those in some upcoming one-on-ones um, and, and then can go from there and, and decide if there should need to be a workshop. Um, there are some sensitive discussions as part of that, and we can further explain that in our one-on-ones. Even if you just make me a shiny infographic that I know would make Commissioner Madden happy as well, <laughs> um, that, you know, you could present that I, not, nothing breaching public, you know, things that might hinder us in any kind of communications that we're having with outside entities or anything like that, sure. but just sort of a broad base hey, this is what it looks like, this is what our staffing numbers look that. like, let's do what we've been doing, and then how we're pushing sure. forward into the future. Yeah, we can do that. I think that's a good idea. Commissioner Walker. Commissioner Musahan was up first. He loves to just do that. <laughs> well, you no, have was I appreciate it. Listen, I appreciate it. Uh, thank Tony. Are you, uh, so, uh, you're, you know, are you excited about this? I mean, do you look at this and, and you know, talking with all your peers across the, the state and nation as they're, mm -hmm you know, trying to do the same thing that you're doing. Do you, do you look at this as the, as the, the right direction for us? And, and are you, are you excited about it? Well, I mean, I'm, I've, I've been directed to, you know, there's a bottom line issue that we need to address and I'm doing my job to get to that point. Do you think um, this is the best way to go about it? Oh yeah, this is the only way to go about it, as okay. far as I'm concerned, based on what we're currently doing. The, yeah. This is this is the route that we need to take if we're going to get to the to the goal that the the commission's. You're set talking out. to a guy who loves to be able to provide the city with performances and and productions, and that's the piece he has to miss in the process of that, right? That's true. Yeah, there'll be less. There'll be less um, events that the public could come and enjoy at the RP Funding Center. Just, but we're, the goal would be to try to you know, backfill that with companies uh, that would, would want to rent the building and provide the same type of entertainment. And that would be the goal. Um, but then your, your, you, you and your staff's job then switches from going out and finding classic concert shows to the people who promote that and convince them to rent the space. Correct. Okay. And more cheerleading and basketball yeah. and yeah. those kinds of events that are high school based and that and rent it for a facility 
because that's where there's can be predictable revenue, which by the way, the good news of is that brings lots of parents and lots of spending down to the restaurants downtown and around because people come into town, lots of beds uh, uh, used in hotels. So that's the other side. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Walker, at this point in time, if you are ready to go. I, I am. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Music, for even um, th that particular comment on, and the question you asked because in, in, in my mind, I think about, you know, what the center historical pur purpose was and it's moving forward. And I, I think and I say, well, what does our citizens say? What, what, what are they saying? I know we, we hear about, you know, the subsidy that we have dealt with for years that I've been on this commission. It's not the first conversation. So, are we, have we heard if what Joe Blow and Jane Blow's citizen are saying and what they would like to see or, and in support of, in support of that, I'm asking if they knew to have all these different performances and those kind of things as a cost involved and, you know, where does that cost, you know, kind of come from? I, I just ask that question, you know, it was in the back of my mind, what, what, what are our citizens saying? Well, I think well, we I, move from, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, I, 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 I think they'll, they'll, some of that will be missed, for sure. But I don't think we've broached the subject to, to the public at this point. So, so I, you know, going back seven years when I was hired to do this job, it was, part of it was those events and, and understanding that they're lost leaders in many cases, but that it it has serves a purpose, particular to the community. So that would shift. I think that we do very good at the other part of it, the rental business. Sure. And that drives economic impact, which is super important. Sure. We talked about um, going back to the last time I was up in front of you there, and, and previous to that, where Mark Jackson talked to the group and told you that we generate $88 million in economic impact, and that's in a good, you know, one of our best years. I know that that number is, you know, could be scrutinized, but if you can cut it in half, it's still a pretty pretty decent amount, and that's, that's a number that we feel strongly about. And it's coming back. We're com you know, our events are coming back. So, you know, it, it, you look at, you know, where we're at budget-wise this year, I think we're in a good place. We're getting to a good place where I was worried last time I uh, was in front of you about COVID and what it was gonna, when it was gonna bounce back, but it's, we're go, we're, it's coming back. We you know our business is coming back. So I'm encouraged by that, um, that rental business. I'm not afraid that, that that's gonna be something. And I, matter of fact, my plan when I uh, stood in front of you last time was focusing on that kind of business mm -hmm. uh, and, and still continuing to do the other business. That was maybe it took us a little bit longer to get, to a better budget number, but that was my goal. Sure. Well, in, 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 in hindsight, uh, pre-pandemic situations, pre-COVID, moving out of COVID, mm -hmm. you, you don't think, you, would you think we would have had to still deal with such a large subsidy? I was, I was, again, my plan, I put together a five-year plan at that point, it was it was going to take us closer to a, a subsidy. I think that the commission would be uh, a, would would enjoy more, but I think it just would have taken us a longer time. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't preclude the shift too on a longer term basis. Sure, you know, sure, sure. Yeah, we, and we, we yeah, always true. we always I know we can always shift back or go back to making sure that we're providing more. Yeah, and we it, if we could find that the rental side of the entertainment business will would would grow um because it's probably it's a small portion of our of our entertainment business now you know the bigger portion of what we're producing is is ours i would say a quarter uh three quarters to two thirds is, is what we produce but that really is you know um there's a lot involved in putting that together there's a large cost involved in the potential that it's a flat or loser you know and or in some cases it's, they're winners but yeah. but it would be our goal would be to backfill that 
three quarters with as many of those rental entertainment events that we can. It's to provide as much as we can with performances, Absolutely. et cetera. We, we're going to continue to. help to, our citizens still know how to drive to Absolutely. Jacksonville to right. perform us. Right. <laughs> and you'd snag anything that was a Seinfeld that came along. Of course. And yeah, we're doing really good with comedy lately, if you haven't. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those are rentals. Yeah. And they're very, being very successful for us, so we're, we're happy about that. And if we can continue that trend, we certainly will do so. Shermad. Thank you, Tony. So um, certainly it was a huge um, emphasis at the strategic planning, and it has been a high priority for me, you know, in the last four or five budget hearings um, to really just ask the tough questions. And I know that, you know, we really scrutinized the Cleveland Heights golf course and, and then our PEEP funding center because those are two things that are a little different from the rest of the amenities that we provide and that they we there are cases for having a business model where you have a management system who can come in and, and and manage those entities more like a business so you know you really don't do that usually at the pool or to some of the other facilities parks um, and so I think that that has been a huge um, question from the citizens and particularly at budget time when you're ever considering a millage increase then that means all of the amenities we provide are a luxury. You know, they're wonderful, and, and certain people, you know, partake in certain amenities more than others. But when it does come to paying to go to a Broadway show and then having your neighbors subsidize that experience, that's a lot to ask. You know, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, I'm going to, I don't like to drive to Jacksonville or Tampa, but do you like your neighbors to pay for you to pay for your ticket to go to our local RP funding center to attend one? So, you know, those, it, that's why it's different. You know, the, that's why we talk about it during the budget discussion. And that's why, frankly, we wanted to make sure that are we doing the best we can with this facility and every business, every private business has to look at their SWOT analysis. They have to look for when things are being disrupted, how they can be nimble and change and grow so that they can stay above water. And that's kind of what our citizens have been asking us to, to look into the RP Funding Center, how we've done business in the past. Should we change? Which direction should we go? How could we be more profitable? How could we get the subsidy down? And so I would be disappointed today, as much as I love Tony, if he didn't have a somber and grave look on his expression, because I've had to shut down screen printing embroidery and lay off people during COVID, and that's what people in the business community do, and that's when they get frustrated, is if their government isn't making commensurate cuts and serious looks towards efficiencies for their citizens, knowing it's taxpayer dollar that's paying for these things. So I know it's hard when we have to make cuts to salaries and let go of people. And I know you're doing that. And I know you expressed it to each of us in our one-on-ones and that's difficult for you as it's difficult for any leader to have to let people go. I hope that our city manager did what he said and really reached out. I personally asked to reach out to the Vinnick company, you know, someone I knew locally and, and, and to reach out as best we could. Is there someone who could do this better? Is there someone who could manage this more profitably than a government can? Because the government does have to think of everyone. And we do want to look to our nonprofits and the ISO and our graduations as a civic center. So I'm hopeful that with the budget cuts that you're contemplating with regard to salary and staff, with the, um, that you really did you know, your best to look at a management company, so that we can look citizens in the eye and say we didn't just kind of do that, but we really did, that we're really doing the hard work behind the scenes to make sure that um, we're, we're, we're looking at this in a serious way. And I would hope that um, if you have the next six months, it sounds like it's going to be status quo, you know, keeping these contracts in order, that gives you six months to present to us a business plan like we would expect a management company to do. And I, you know, I can always, I can love and appreciate people, but I have to also say I need some accountability. I need to see the benchmarking of why the subsidy has been what it has been and how the new business plan as we pivot towards a rental facility is what your forecasts are. I mean, certainly Mike Brokart, Brosart, like Commissioner McCarley, 
Those are projections and a forecasting that he does on our day's cash. We're not holding you to that. There's not, you know, there's unforeseen things. I'd like a similar uh, forecasting like my colleagues have asked for. I also think that we should definitely think about, to me, it's like when we looked at um, Mr. Brosart talking about Mr. Beck in the community and doing the Heritage Garage as a P3. That to me is the best case scenario. It's when you have government and philanthropy and private businesses coming together and, and you've got skin in the game and everyone's working together for the best of their city. I think it's difficult when it's kind of, should this be private or should this be government? And then there's sort of a faction on which side's smarter or better, you know, what angle we should go and what's best for citizens. But I think that we have this huge opportunity on the west side of Lakeland with the Bonnet Springs Park coming on board this fall. And you think about people who will be coming to our community to go to Bonnet Springs Park. Are we going to be marketing that? Will they be staying in those hotels? Can we also think about when you're pivoting towards this rental facility and now that they rent this facility and they're next to this you, you know, world-renowned park, how does that change their decision making than it would two years ago if we didn't have the park on board? Um, how can we partner with TDC and the Polk County Sports Marketing? I, for one, sit on that board and have seen, and I always am passing those receipt, receipts to the mayor because they said, we can't be Disney World, we can't be the, uh, the beach. As much as we'd like to have Broadway or we'd like to be someone else, it's really better for realistic and who are we in Polk County and what gets heads and beds and what our county determined, it was that port, the sports marketing. It was moms and dads taking their kids to lacrosse tournaments and volleyball tournaments and basketball tournaments that kept us afloat during COVID when frankly the rest of the state was having more difficulty when things were shut down. So I do feel like that pivot towards a sports marketing focus is, um, could be profitable and sounds good. I, I'm, I appreciate what I'm hearing today and what we heard in our one-on-ones. But I will say, I am the voice of the people. I'm a voice of the business community. I'm a voice of taxpayers. And so I have to be able to feel like I can go back in good conscience and say, this is why we're not getting a management um, company. This is what we're going to do in the next six months, and this is what we're hopeful to do. And I have to be able to have some accountability with some benchmarking, like they said, where have we been with our subsidy? Where do you think this is going to go in one year, two years, three years? Why do you think that's true? Get some data and, and s statistical support from the um, county, which they should have because of how we fared even during COVID with that um, sports marketing focus at least. So I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm really doing the best job here on the fly of yeah. trying to communicate my thoughts, but I do feel like people watch this and people are paying attention and it has, just like the other things, just like it was the golf course or whatever, if you play golf or if you're, you know, people, there's certain things that they're wanting to scrutinize and they elect us to ask the tough questions to make sure we're doing the behind the scenes work. And so um, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I feel like I, you know, um, you know, that, you're doing what you've said you've done, but I, I do feel like hope's not a strategy and that I will need to see some accountability um, with a business plan. A lot of the things that you mentioned we're doing, we're, we're a strong partner with Polk County. Uh, we, we are hosting the Florida High School Basketball Championships for over 20 years. We're, we've added the weightlifting. We're probably gonna add more in the future, boys and girls. Um, we're right in the middle of that. So to, to, to your point, those are the things that we do and we do well already. So um, do we focus on those more? Yeah, maybe we do, but we have to take into consideration, um, you know, more and more of that opportunity. Um, and it's, 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 it's never anything that I haven't brought to the table and expressed to you that we, we are doing. So it's, it's a little bit confusing sometimes to hear some of those things, but I, I'm to, for your, for the planning purposes and being able to show you exactly where we're gonna come from, go to, from point A to point B is, is very understandable. Our budgets are set. We've talked about next year's budget. We're gonna get through the first half of the year with status quo and we shift. And that shift is, is, is very clear. We've been in this business for a long time. We know what's expected. We know what we, we have and what's, how that's gonna shift and change. And the, the, the savings in uh, expense will be the big, the big shift for us. So when we start, when we, we're doing as much rental business as we're doing now, 
we shifted in lower expenses uh, and then continue to go after fill those holes we, we expect those revenues to increase and that's where we're going to get to the point where where uh, the Commission asked us to be uh, six months ago well and I and in summary I know Commissioner Madden's point kind of reflects the pain of the process which is what she was really expressing the desire to make sure there's greater financial accountability which I want to compliment you and our team on having done well because if you did orchestrate RFPs that was kind of a difficult thing to define you did do the search we did get responses back and it wasn't as potentially profitable as we felt it might be for an outside entity to do this meaning you aren't as far off the mark but all that said but then the but is we're asking for just the accountability to watch it going forward and so I think we're all in this together this is was touchier for us because we did apply the pressure in terms of you know the particular subsidy area in 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 this and that's the sensitivity that Commissioner Madden's expressing so um the other side of that coin is you did on a great job of getting it done and I know Vinick was one of the people that were uh, approached as well so that's it's nice to know that you have considered all the things that needed to be done so thank you for that thank you mayor and just you know I, I do want to comment on the you know the we we will prov provide you know some projections um, based on this shift in business model and and that's really the the difference now you know we we've done that previous I mean we we've we've had one-on-one -on -one discussions and and Tony has brought in a couple of different plans that identified kind of what we could do where we could make cuts where we could increase revenue to get us you know closer to what eventually became you know a, a threshold that the Commission set at strategic planning now the position that we're in is we're in this budget development and so half of the year is going to include you know honoring the contracts that we have but then that second half of the year is where that's that's what's changing here we're, what the projections you saw previously the recommendations previously were based on continuing on the way we've been doing business and promoting shows and and taking risk in that we're going to get away from that and so we can now show some projections based on this this new model um, to try to make sure that we're tracking along to accomplish what we hear from the Commission okay uh, and then Commissioner McLeod Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Tony, again. Is there a center uh, out there that you look at that is similar to what w we are trying to do and you would consider them best in class and, and a um, center that you would say this is where we can learn from or strive to, to be more like this? There, there's not a lot of venues that are like us because we are an arena, a meeting space, and a theater. So a lot of venues that we would compare ourselves to are either one or the other, one of the three. That's the difficult part. And we're in a unique market because of where we're placed in the middle of Tampa and Orlando. So when we know that there's a struggle with that market, but the things I mentioned, like for example, the comedy that's starting to come to the venue is, is sort of the niche that we would continue to, to go after. Uh, a rent, as a, from a rentals perspective, but it's really hard because even though there's a venues, a, f a handful of venues that are similar to us around the country, there's not many that compare us to. And then you have to look at our market. Our market's really the thing that makes us unique. Sure. And I know you and I talked about this in our one-on-one, -on -one, but I think it's good for public discussion. Do you think our market, being in between two major cities, that played a role in the the lack of responses you know, from the to the RFP? Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously um, these companies are know what they're doing. They're they're very large. They manage venues all, all around the country. If they looked at, I mean, we gave them a lot of information. We gave them just about everything on our books that for them to to evaluate it. I can't say exactly what their business decision was that they decided not to, um, but you know, that's uh, they their the valuation told them that wasn't a, a something for them to go after and it might be because we're a little bit unique um, but it's hard to tell to because they, they were very, the, the responses were very generic that we got back that point though Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Walker I don't know whether or not you all can um, share uh, publicly again uh, as to what we discussed in our one-on-ones but if you can't, I, uh, because of what could be a, an arrangements or 
contractual kind of um, discussions going on. But we'll there in hopes of what's going on with some things that we know. Uh, and just going picking back on what Commissioner McLeod was saying about some things we, we know discussing our one-on-ones that could bring about some additional revenue. If that is the case, would it help even more with our uh, subsidy kind of situation? Would that help bring down or it just? I mean, we're continuing to negotiate our contract with the Magic and working with the Tropics. Yes. And there's things in the pipe that are always going to be financially um, important to our next steps. Will, will they make a, a huge um, uh, impact? It's, it's hard to say at this point. We just we need to let that process play out before we can, can say that. Would it, would it fill the gap that we're talking about here? No, it won't, but it'll, it, you know, it, it'll, be, help reduce it'll be very helpful. Yeah, okay. definitely. I mean, and that is the goal in the negotiations and through those partners that were mentioned. I mean, yes. they're, they're very aware that a lot of the negotiations were because we are looking to reduce that subsidy. And the more we can glean from those contracts, the, the, the more it takes, uh, it reduces that subsidy. Let, 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 me, let me say something if I could. I, I was not going to say it, but I think it's, it's, it's needed. We are in a different market. I don't think any of us should not know that. You know, we we we're, we're we're between two metropolises, the east and west. And I, I think even when I was in business myself, and having to deal with the situation as such, even having the ownership of an Allstate insurance agency for almost twenty six, well, over twenty six years, it was times when we, and even though I was under under that umbrella, in sales and, and trying to make sure I hit the numbers that in order to keep the Allstate logo on my building, you know, I was in competition quite a bit, not only just among all Allstaters in Lakeland, but also between Tampa and Orlando. I had to deal with that because we are unique. We're, in, we're between two metropolises. And even when planning stages, planning time come, and going to find out whether or not Lakeland was going to be part of the Tampa market or the Orlando market. It was like, oh, wow, where are we going to be this year? And those numbers have an effect on corporate entities, as I'm sure you just alluded to, about whether or not is Lakeland going to be the place that we can do these things. So I, I think we, don't, we tend to forget that we are unique in that respect when it comes to sometimes certain kinds of business and the business kind of situations that we have to uh, deal with. So my two cents. Um. Commissioner Music. Real quick, the, um, to, to piggyback on that just a little bit, oh, thank you. Um, when we have somebody who rents a facility like the direction that we're going to head, like the, the Seinfeld group when they came here and that was successful, do you know, do they share, do you have any insight why they chose our center as opposed to the different areas that we're, that we're talking with? It's, it's for various reasons, to be honest with you. For, for Seinfeld, for example, he was... He hadn't been on the road for a while, so he was testing out material, basically. And he had been here before, so he's familiar. A lot of our, you know, a lot of our uh, acts return or, or the promoting companies come back because they have a good experience here with the, with the team at the RP Funding Center, to be quite honest. Okay, so there isn't like something where you can look and say, well, we're, you know, we're 18% lower or our parking was this, so there wasn't something specific that you can look and say, here's, here's where we're. Well, there's there's definitely metrics that we use to to determine whether something's going to be successful or not, but it's a changing atmosphere, so it's it's sometimes difficult to to roll the dice and do that. Costs are expensive, we know that, um, but over the years, being a lost leader like we were for some of that entertainment was was okay. When I say okay, the commission was in in the in the in the community was okay, understanding that you're going to get that. Um, and again, my, my balance is always the economic impact piece saying, okay, we're going to do a lot of that rental business because that's going to put heads in beds and help the overall community, but we're going to do our entertainment events where we're going to take some risk and maybe mm -hmm. not maybe break even or lose a little, but that we're providing that entertainment. So when you balance the two, that's kind of what, you know, the <laughs> philosophy, if you, if you're looking at it at that point was, was existed. So, um, but 
you know, understanding the direction of, of, that the commission has put us on, we know the things that we need to adjust to get to that number. So we can we can start doing that. But again, it's one of those 12 to 18 month lead things. Sure, absolutely. Anything else? Yeah, Commissioner Reed. You know, we talk about Lakeland being a unique spot. <clears throat> of course, invariably, a lot of things we don't understand, uh, an event may want to come to Lakeland but they've got a contractual obligation. They can't be within Tampa, Orlando, within 100 miles, right. and they can't be there within three months of each other. So we're kind of, you know, it may be in Orlando here, in Tampa, in Tampa there, and we're kind of cut out because we're within a 100 mile radius, and it's been within two, three, four, five, six months. So there's a lot of different other things that, that come into play in these events, uh, you know, and we're gonna probably have more gun shows we'll have more big buck stuff like that which is stuff that we, we do well that, and it'll get a lot of attention because of the, the location we're at and, and over the years when we were asked ever asked the question why aren't we doing you know the big acts like you know bon jovi or whoever who's back here in the day it's because they built venues in, in orlando and they built yes, venues sir. in tampa that mm -hmm. have more it's a simple math it's you're going to sit you know in a an event a facility that holds 6,000, you're gonna to go to somewhere that holds 18,000. You're gonna to go to 18 because your your opportunity to make more money is there. That's simple. We that saw matters. Elton John here, just want you to know that. There you go, thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you uh, Commissioner Matt, uh, McCarley, sorry. And, and Bon Jovi twice. And Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. <laughs> um, so just for the public at large, and just I think, Tony, what you said a little while ago is really important. Not. Not so much the fact that we, yes, we are unique and that we're on the I-4 corridor between Tampa and Orlando. I think we all understand that, but it's, you have three business models. You have a theater, you have an arena, and then you have a convention center. So looking that in its entirety is really difficult, which is probably why we didn't get a good response on the RFP, because those are three separate business models. So I think when you come back and you share with us you know, sort of your game plan and even retroactively looking at historically, it would be helpful to me to know, okay, what in the theater generated X, what generated X in the arena, and what generated in the convention center, because those are three different entities. And when you're talking about Tampa and Orlando, the radius of a big events is a big, is, is a big part of this, of just what Commissioner Reed said. But also, if you look at Tampa and Orlando, if you look at Amelie and um, Amway, you have luxury suites. So our, the market has completely changed with regard to sporting events and even concerts, because there are companies that come in and pay for, you know, suites, and they also have X number of seats in the stadium to see whatever sporting event or whatever, uh, you know, concert there is or whatever it is in the arena. We don't have that. So that's why the pivoting is so important that I think you're doing and making your game plan of how do we utilize what we have, understanding that capital expense is outside of it, but looking at those almost in three separate business models and really defining what those business models look at. Instead of an overarching business model for just one center, since it is one center, but really drilling into those pieces. And I think that'd be good for the public to understand as well. I've never heard, just being candid, that the trade-off that you were mentioning between the Broadway series, you know, we're doing these other things to generate income so we can do something that is a loss leader. Like, I don't know that the general public understands that because I probably didn't put those two things together until you just said them. So that's very helpful to that's sure. very helpful to understand is that that was something that historically the commissions before us were okay with. Well, Absolutely. that's good information to have yeah. that we haven't really discussed before. So I just want to be clear for the public that you're looking at three different businesses, yeah. how we can work around that and 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 move forward to do this and is a really important thing, but I still would like to look historically back before we move forward and catapult forward into what the future is going to look like, but having something hard and not just verbal would be really, really helpful for me. Good. Okay. Yeah, just one, I'll point out one thing too. Um, when we were doing the renovation and we were planning for the renovation, there was a lot of money when I, when I got here in the plan to put into the arena. And I shifted that because I knew that our bread and butter was gonna be the rental business. So our improvements to carpeting and walls and new chairs and things for that yeah. meetings type business was important to me. So I knew we were going to be able to do the other things. We actually replaced the seats in the theater too, so that was good. But I knew we were going to do that other business, but I knew that it was the most important piece was that meetings business because I think that was our bread and butter and that's the economic impact and that's 
really in my business, that's what's important to us is, is that piece. You're going to grow that piece in this model change Absolutely. for the city. Sure. So that's wonderful. And plus, it matched the capital needs of the building instead of building suites and all those kinds of yeah, things. Definitely. You still have the difficulty. I have one more ad, and then yes, I'll be quiet. Um, if we're <laughs> when we, I just want everyone to remember, as we talk about economic impact of all of these things happening at the Lakeland Center, when we talk about arts, I want you to realize that sometimes we don't think arts has an economic impact, and we say that sports has more. It's equal. So sometimes, you know, arts economic impact discussions kind of go by the wayside of, oh, you can't really point to that. It is a nebulous number, just like you said. Like some people say it's 80 million. It could be at least 40 million. But if we're being cognizant about it, I think we need to talk about that universally across the board and not negate one economic impact area for another. Oh, so yeah. that's just a con not directed at you. That's in general. Well, yeah. And in, in our entertainment piece when we talked about it all the time that was always part of that economic impact number we can pull out what that means but that was always part of it. we do have people coming from outside the community to visit broadway and to see classic albums in particular there's people from outside the community that are coming here and buying gas and staying at the hotel and going to dinner so that's that's part of it then that's why again that's why that model worked yes yeah, there's okay i think that covers us Thank you. Thank you very much for your Thank time, you. sir. Okay. And plans. Um, we'll we'll move into uh, back to uh, Mike Brosart, and it's time to start talking about the maximum uh, millage uh, discussion with the commission. Um, beyond that, uh, it is the the balance of the the rest of the day is determined by the commission and the discussions that you want to have. We do have uh, should have lunch here in about. 15 minutes so if we get started and then we could break for lunch break after Mike's done reconvene That'd be great. okay so with that Mike will take it okay um, <clears throat> the the state of Florida requires that we all municipalities advise uh, their property appraiser uh, by the 4th of August uh, each year uh, to define what our maximum millage should be advertised and so this discussion is something that we, we wanted to have with you today. We are not, we will take an answer today and all we're gonna need is a thumbs up or you, you can provide an answer to us uh, on the first, which is a commission meeting. Uh, we don't have an agenda study scheduled for the 29th. Uh, so it would just, or the, or the first for that matter. So it would be you know, during a verbal from the city manager that if you do not want to make the decision today, you want to think about what is discussed amongst the seven of you and you want to tell us on the first, that's just fine. That still gives us time to, to notify Marsha Fox's team and the state as to what we would advertise as our maximum millage. So just a quick reminder, uh, um, you can, if we provide a maximum millage, whatever the number is that you choose. You can, during the first and second uh, budget hearings in September, the 8th and the 22nd, you can lower that millage and we do not have to re-advertise, okay? However, if you choose to adopt a millage that is greater than that, we, we run into a little bit of a challenge because we then have to re-advertise and you start running into time constraints with, with the state. So uh, the advice is that you talk amongst yourselves between today and, and if there's a workshop between now and then or it's just again on the first, uh, great. Uh, but we, we suggest that you, you strongly consider the top end of what you, you might see amongst the seven of you or majority of you in any case. So, and, we, and to that end, just as we go through this, I think it would be wise without pressuring any of us in this but if we can do it today that's one less meeting to do if we're just trying to find a maximum rate we'd set as we go through this based on what we haven't finished doing yet which is the next section correct also correct okay after that fact in other words not now <laughs> in this moment correct <laughs> so as as mentioned we we had the the marshal provided us a number of 1466 uh, the, so the values inside our city limits are estimated at, at approximately $9.5 billion. 
the the portion for new construction is up about 1.7 million, and the increase in taxable values is about 4.9 million. As noted uh, a few slides back under my section, the rollback rate is 4.9825. How do we compare to others in Polk County as of today, recognizing that, that others may change it up, down, or keep the same? Here's where we land compared to our <coughs> counterparts across the county at 5.4323. I would point out that based on the city manager's recommendation for police and fire if we added 0.3326 mills to that we would slide just above polk city at 5.76 so for right now uh, we we usually give a recommendation our recommendation is to consider 5.4323 unless you decide that you want to add police and fire personnel, in which case we're recommending that you go higher to the by additional 0.3326. So the last slide is something we've talked about in the past, but it simply defines thresholds. Thresholds for simple majority, super majority, or unanimous, okay? So the rollback rate is 4.9825. For those curious as to why there is a simple majority threshold that's higher, the state defines a CPI that's per capita income, and it's 1.0627% or something. And so we simply multiply the 4.9825 mills times that per capita and you get the, the top end of the threshold for simple majority of 5.2879. 5 if the commission were to adopt anything above 5.2879, they would need a supermajority of five, okay? So that means if you pop to the top bullet, if you wanted to adopt our current millage of 5.4323, you would require a supermajority. We had that same occasion this year. If for some reason the commission decided that they wanted to go ab above 5.8167 mills, say they, they wanted to add more police officers than the city manager has recommended, that would require a unanimous decision of all seven, and that's all seven, no matter how many show up for that for those two votes. And the second vote's the most important vote. Yeah, but you have to have all seven there for unanimous. My sense is that's not where, where we're leaning. I just want you to understand what your thresholds are going forward. Questions about this slide? Chair Walker and then Commissioner McCarley. Make sure I understand, uh, Mr. Rosart. Now, if we if we go up the, go with what's been recommended by our city manager at five point four three two three, where we are right now, that includes his um, public safety re request. Is that correct? No, no. I think no, so. They, they, I think so. It's it would be five point seven something. Yeah, 5 .7 something. Right. Okay. That's why I make sure I had it in my mind. Right. I'm going to bring you back to that slide. That's the slide, 5.7649, yes. yes. Okay. That's the current millage plus 0.3326 mills to pay for the debt service on the station, mm -hmm. 12 firefighters, 12 police officers, and one police lieutenant. Yes, ma'am. That requires five votes. Five. Yes. That's, that's correct. That's super majority. Yeah. Yes. And that's if we use ARPA funds for the equipment. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Make sure I was thinking correct. Thank you. Now, the, the ARPA, let me just clarify that for the commissioner. The ARPA funds for the equipment. All we're 
counting on using the ARPA funds for right now is 900,000 for the fire truck is our estimate is, you know, right now, as well as 13 vehicles for police right now, as well as all the equipment associated, body cams, all of that, right? That's all that will be used in this current or upcoming budget year. Thinking differently. I just want you thinking we were using all 2.9 Right, right away. But you're not. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Reed. I have a couple questions. Is there more fire equipment we're going to have to acquire than the 900000 Is that going to cover all the fire equipment and the other going to take care of all our police department? Yes, sir. Okay, that's one question. Why have we got 5.8167 up here as the maximum rate when we're asking for 5.7? No, no, I have to show you. I'm required to show you what the thresholds are. Right. This you couldn't go higher than that. There's no way we, we can't even approve higher than that. I know this. this what, what the state requires, <laughs> right. and, and I could have better clarify that, and I apologize. That The top one there, the, ma the millage for the supermajority, right. uh, that 5.8167 is 10% above the, th the middle number of the 5.2879. We're required to calculate what is 10% above. Yes. Okay. That's why that number is there. We're not recommending any of those numbers. You just need to know what your thresholds are when we talk about maximum millage. Okay. Now, can, can we massage the numbers? We talked about what, what I was asking. Can you give me the 5.279 and the, and the 5.43223? Do it now or you want to? Break. Do you want to start that now, Commission, that or to the break? Okay, yeah, lunch. All yeah. right. Because we might have some other things we want to talk about, too. Yes, Commissioner Music. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Music. So if, if I understand this, this correctly, that in, in order for us to be able to afford our police and fire as we're talking about it now, then we have to, we have to be at the 5.764, correct? The way that the way that this is sitting i mean we we don't have that money sitting somewhere else so in order for us to be able to That's afford correct. it right. we have to be able to do that so oh, that, i mean obviously i'm only speaking for one of the seven but i mean we can't possibly i mean we can't we can't sit here and tell our citizens that we're not gonna be supportive of fire and police i just don't i don't see how that's going to go and i and I, i'm all about having spreadsheets because i like being able to implement all these numbers but we're going to sit here and talk forever and circle back around to the same exact thing but commissioner the only thing i would want to point out is back to though the day's cash because you 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 might adjust the the, the day's cash projections to, and Mike, I don't know. You'd have to tell me: is, is there enough to adjust? Okay. That yeah, and you're right. I remember doing that. I remember doing that last year. You're right. I remember doing that last year. But for lunch, so here, yeah. here's, yeah. okay. Yes, to, sir. Just to answer your question, Commission <laughs> Music, um, I recommend if you are going to uh, take on the potential for this many people using extra monies above what we have normally received these are one-time monies All right this is a one-time influx of cash over the prior year okay 1466 is not a sustainable number my recommendation from a financial standpoint is raise the millage some slightly whatever it ends up being to cover as much of that as you possibly can we didn't last year with the body camps and that's a million dollars a year okay that we're just paying for out of what were excess monies. My recommendation is you fund these with a millage in some fashion. But if you, after lunch, you say, you know what, we, let's show me what it looks like at 0.32 or 0.30. I can show you what the day's cash are and then, you, and then show you if you decide you want to add five or six next year or the year after, I can show you that. And then the seven of you tell us what you feel comfortable with for the day's cash and the, 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 the variance between years. And you tell us. We're just giving you our best advice. And in the process, too, recognize that, that not having those four to five officers in there in the following years 
part of the hedge against that, even as we look at this, is the fact that we're looking at 4% appreciation on property for two years. So that is our sandbag, yeah. you know, and so, but things can get bad, and we've seen things yeah. get bad before. And um, so part of that's all the discussion, and we still haven't looked at what the commission may want to add to this that we haven't done yet. So um, let, that's why we're breaking for lunch. <laughs> Any other comments? All right. Lunch. Let's eat. Mr. Mayor, just how, how long would you would the commission like to take? The, the lunch is provided right behind you there. So 20 how, minutes. But was, was, let's start at 1225. Twenty-five. Twenty. Perfect. I'm gonna be done. Just put your microphone up. Yeah. Well, I'm not fast either. I mean, I'm Kevin always, Ford is I, ice I, I know.